So it is uh, my okay. it is, uh, it is my okay. pleasure and honor today to congr to, to welcome all of you to attend this very special session uh, from ASNT Distance Learning. The, today uh, we have the pleasure and honor uh, to have three elegant speakers. They are figures by themselves and by the school that uh, they belong to, uh, Qasr al Aini University Hospital. And this is a, uh, the, the, the most uh, distinguished school in Egypt since a long time. And today we have three eminent speakers, uh, Professor Maya Hasaballah, Professor of Nephrology at Qasr al Aini and uh, President-elect of ASNT, uh, Professor Gamal al Saadi, the past president of SNT and the current uh, president of African Society of Organ Transplantation. And he is a well-known figure, um, professor of nephrology, uh, Qasr al-Aini School. Uh, professor Hussain al-Fishawi will speak about HCV associated glomerulopathy. From Mansoura, we have Professor Munir, Munir Bahgat. He is well-known here in Mansoura. And he is... Uh, uh, no, uh, well known by his talent in education and he will share us the perspectives of hepatology in uh, prescription and dispensing of direct antiviral drug against hepatitis C. Uh, so uh, let me to introduce Professor Maya Hasaballah, the first speaker, and Professor Maya will, uh, will speak updating hepatitis C management in chronic kidney disease and hemodialysis patients. Professor Maya. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hussein, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all, and it's really a great honor to share this session with Professor Gamal Zadi and Professor Hussein Fishawi, and, and I'd like to thank Professor Hussein Shaisha for the tremendous efforts he is doing to bring these meetings to life. And of course, I'd like to welcome Professor Munir Turnir, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, in this meeting. And let me start by asking you this question. Uh, what is the effect of HCV on the kidney? Is it implicated in CKD onset? Does it accelerate progression of CKD to end stage renal disease? Does it increase mortality in dialysis patients? Does it reduce the long-term patient and graft survival after transplantation? Or is it all of the above? So I'm is, sure that you will all agree. <laughs> All of them. Are. All of them. <laughs> yes. And it's not just about the kidney, it's about uh, a multi systemic disease affecting other organ systems. And it's not just uh, by producing antibodies or autoimmunity, but it also has a direct cytotoxic effect. It replicates in the. Uh, uh, sorry. It replicates in the plagues and produces. Uh, Okay. Okay. So it replicates in the plates and produces pro inflammatory cytokines that are going to result in chronic local and systemic infl inflammation that will cause chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. It is a significant and independent risk factor for mortality in dialysis patients. So uh, we have many studies showing that, uh, uh, for instance, this one with 175 patients, out of which 57 uh, had anti-HCV uh, positive, and you can see the difference in uh, uh, graft survival in eight years. And this is a bigger study by Cam Calander on uh, one, more than 1,500 HCV positive patients compared to more than 12,000 HCV negative patients. And you can see here that the longer the time on dialysis, the greater the instance. But if you look at the those uh, where HCV worsen survival, this occurs in all groups, whether uh, in, irrespective of the ethnic group, whether the patients are diabetic or not, whether it's a male or a female, uh, whether the age is above or below 65 years, so and so on and so forth. So this disease is really associated with mortality in dialysis patients. And in spite of that, the Egyptian renal data system in the year 2019 
showed that only 30% of the patients on dialysis have, have received treatment. So this is a call to treat all our patients on dialysis for HCV. Now, what about those who are not on dialysis? What does treatment offer to them? It is really associated with clinical benefits. And this is one of those studies. I just don't want to go into details, but at the end of the day, you have that number of patients. And uh, if you look at the results, uh, there is an improvement and increase in the GFR, especially in the non-diabetic patients, uh, when you compare it before treatment to after treatment. Whereas in the diabetic patients, there is still a decline, but not to the, to the uh, extent of it used to be before a treatment. And if you look at the albuminuria, there is a reduction in albuminuria again in the non-diabetic as compared to the diabetic. The diabetic, there was still uh, a reduction, but it was a milder reduction. And the conclusion was that directly acting antiviral therapy for HCV may slow chronic kidney disease progression, particularly in patients with non-diabetic chronic kidney disease. And this has been published in the Kidney International in January 2020. And you can see here, especially in those patients with a GFR less than 60, you have a marked reduction in, in the slow uh, compared uh, pre-treatment pre to post-treatment, which was very uh, significantly different. And also it shows here that there was a significant difference when you compare diabetics to non-diabetics and when you compare uh, those with a GFR less than 60 as compared to those with a GFR more than 60. So it does not mean that uh, it is not good in diabetic patients. It's just less good, but it is very effective in diabetic patients, not only for the GFR, but also an improvement of insulin sensitivity and in diabetes itself. And this is another very important study here showing that it was done in diabetic type 2 patients to study the uh, complications. And if you compare those patients that did not receive treatment, which is a solid lines, as uh, those who attain a sustained viral response, you can see a marked significant difference in the incidence of acute coronary syndrome, end-stage renal disease, ischemic stroke, and retinopathy. So this is really good and has to be treated. And we get our guidelines from the key legal guidelines, last updated 2018, and American Association of the Study of Liver Disease. And I put this here, 2018, just to compare, but it's being updated every few months. And the guidelines say that in patients with CKD seizures 1, 2, and 3, you can use whatever drug combinations with no dose adjustment. Okay, so I'm not sure if all the participants are aware of the directly acting uh, antivirals uh, and their mode of action. So I'll just make it very simple. If this is the viral genome, which is formed of structural and non-structural units, the directly acting antivirals will be targeting one of those units, the NS3, the NS5A, and NS5B. And if you look at the names, uh, if you look at the, the second part of the name, it tells you where the drug acts really. So if it acts at NS3, which is before the five, so it ends with the pre there. If it uh, targets the 5A, so it ends with an as there. And if it targets the 5B, it ends with the bu there. And of course, uh, because they differ in terms of potency, genotypic coverage, and barrier to resistance, you have to use more than one drug together in order to ensure the likelihood of uh, HCV response. So we have uh, uh, our drugs. We have the Sophos-Bouvier-based regimens. We have the Sophos-Bouvier semi, Dacla, Ledi, Valfas, Ver, and you also have triple drug combinations. And you have the non sophos based regimens. You have uh, the Farita Prever, which is bo boosted to Ritonavir to make it in a single daily dose co-formulated with Ambitasvir together with the third drug, which is the Zabuvir, and this is called the 3D or the Pro-D, and this is used for uh, genotype 1. And Parita Prever, Ritonavir, uh, with Ambitasvir without the need for the third drug for oh. genotype 4. And we have the Elvasvir, Grazoprevir, which is the Zipet here, and we have the Gleka Prever, Prevrintasvir, the pan genomic, which is the Maviret, and you also have the Klatasvir Asuna Prevair, which is widely used in Japan. What I need to tell you here is that out of all those drugs, only the Sophosphovir undergoes significant renal excretion. And that's why there was a concern to use it in our CKD patients, and they were denied treatment for some time 
until we started to have the non sclerosis based regimen. I also need to tell you that all these drugs are equally efficient. I'm speaking about efficiency approaching almost 100%. And uh, except for the, uh, for the 3D in the genotype 1A and uh, the 2D in genotype 1.4, to reach the same efficiency, they need to be associated with ribavirin. And just, uh, uh, of course, they can, be used without, they can be used without ribavirin, but they will give you an efficiency of 91% of sustained viral response. Just to let you know that according to the KDU guidelines, patients with a GFR less than 30 mils per minute should be treated with a ribavirin-free, directly acting antiviral based regimen. So let me ask you this question now. Now let's move to the group of patients with the stage four and five, that's to say a GFR less than 30. What is your first drug of choice in treating HCV in patients with stage four and five CKD? Is it going to be the 3D or the 2D? Or is it going to be uh, the uh, Zipatir? Or is it going to be the pangenomic Mavirat? Or is it going to be the Sophosphoveri-based regimens with Ledi, Dakla, or Velpa? Or is it going to be any of the above? Can you please uh, respond to that? The, you, like you can write on the chat uh, to allow the majority of the attendee to participate. Please write on the yes. chat. And I am going to inform Professor May about the, the your feedback. Please. Okay, what's, what's the first drug of choice? in treating stage four and five CKD, advanced CKD. Yes. So they, they, they uh, here one, one selection is two, Elbasver, Grasobrover, Zibater, yes. Zibater, Zibater, Carivo. So, uh, the so better. we have different so selections. The, the majority is better, and I think the, the it is the majority is better, and some Kerivo, no other choices. Yeah. The, the, the and the five, you know, the above. Any uh, of the above. So I I think for my my opinion is any of the above can be used uh, for patients with stage four and five, and the superiority okay. is is the better the best because it is approved in the low GFR. Okay, so uh, you can say any of the above under certain circumstances. Yes. You can just not say any of the above in the absolute, of course. Okay. Uh, okay, if we say it is uh, the Mavirate, which is pangenomic, because it need not, it does not uh, uh, need to be given with uh, ribavirin, it's, it's just given alone. Uh, well, what about Elbosvir, Grasoprevir? We don't, we only have, uh, we have the genotype four in our country, so we don't really care much to have a pangenomic drug. This drug works very good for, uh, for the genotype four, and it also is used with our tribavirin, so that makes them both equal. Well, for the Kirivo in our country here, where the problem is that, as we mentioned, you need to give it with ribavirin to reach the, uh, the, the maximum effect approaching 100%, but it can still be given. Uh, with our trebovirin, and this will give you 91% sustained viral response. Okay, so what if I tell you that we don't have the Mavirat here in Egypt, it's not available, and what if I tell you that the zippet here is expensive? Yes. And what if I tell yes. you that it was the Kirivo that treated all our patients in the past years, and uh, so we can still use uh, the Kirivo with or without trebovirin, and what about the very based regimens? Should we use them or they should not be used? And uh, what if I give you the same question in patients with hepatic decompensation? I think you will all change your first drug of choice to very based regimens. It's actually going to be the only drug of choice because you cannot use the other drugs in this particular group of patients. And according to the guidelines, you can use daily fixed dose of uh, sulfosyl very based regimens. If ribavirin is uh, eligible, you can use a small dose, you can give it for 12 weeks. And if not, then you extend the period to 24 weeks. So uh, what I mean to say is that there are many factors which affect our choice of the directly acting antivirus. It's not just the CKD stage, 
you have to consider the viral genotype. And we know that glycoprid vapivirant is there, is, is given for a genotype. But what if it's not there? For our genotype, or you use the Grasoprevir Elbasbir, or you can use the 2D, which is the Kirivo with or without ribavirin. For genotype 1B, you use it the 3D or the Elbasbir, and it's given without ribavirin. For G1, uh, for genotype 1A, you have to give the 3D with ribavirin, or of course Elbasbir. If it's going to be genotype 2 and 3, you use a Sophosbuvir based regimen or otherwise you can use interferon ribavirin. So viral genotype is very important for us to choose. We also have the extent of liver disease. It's very important like we have seen. And we have the availability, we have the cost, and we have the concomitant medications you have to consider. And we have the presence or absence of viral co-infection. So these are all important factors you have to think about when you come to choose the drug uh, you want. So let's see what the guidelines say. So the guidelines say that you use one of those drugs, they're just as equally effective with a rating of 1B. You use either the uh, zipat here, or you use the, of course, this is for genotype one and four only, or you use the Maviret for, which is a pan genomic, okay? And, and this is the American Association study of liver disease. What about the KDGO? The KDGO mentioned the same things, but they also added an alternative regimen, which is the 3D for genotype one, and strange enough, did not mention the Kiribo for genotype four, which we already used. Okay, what happened from the year 2018 till the end of 2019? We have in the guidelines, the appearance of very based regimens to be used in patients with GFR less than 30 mils per minute. Here we have the daily fixed dose combination of Sophosphovere, Belfatasphere, and this is pangenomic, and the rating here is 1B, and the two other drugs that have been mentioned before is uh, 1A. So what, why does this happen? Why is supposed to where it took them from 2013 to the end of 2019 to add the, the supposed to there in the guidelines for this particular group of uh, kidney patients? Well, actually, in spite of the fact that the concentration of the drug and its uh, metabolite, its primary metabolite is markedly increased in the blood. But we had many studies showing that it is safe. And uh, to the extent now in April 2020 that they put the CKD stages all in one box saying that there is no dose adjustment in directly acting antivirals required when uh, using the recommended regimens except for um, the ribavirin of course, which has to be reduced if it is uh, if it is given, and uh, well, uh, and we have these are the latest studies uh, on that subject. So this uh, study here uh, was on Lidipus varus in full dose, 400 milligrams in patients with uh, CKD stages four and five before dialysis, and we had 100% sustained viral response and treatment was well tolerated without any significant adverse effects. And this is another study in Sophospovarable Patasphere for patients on end-stage renal disease, and it was given for treatment naive as well as treatment experienced patients. And there was a 95% sustained viral response, and again, there were no treatment-related discontinuations or serious study events, adverse events. And this is another study from India on Daclatasvir and reduced dose of Spuvir, and it was given for patients both on dialysis and not yet on dialysis, all with a GFR less than 30. And for those who continued treatment, there was 100% sustained viral response. There was one treatment discontinuation because of pancreatitis, and there was three mortalities that were unrelated to the drug. So, Actually, in November 2019, the FDA amended the package insert sofosfovir containing regimens to allow its use in patients with CKD, including those with GFR less than 30 mLs per minute and those on dialysis. So this was a very important um, addition to, uh, to what's happening in the guidelines. This is a meta-analysis of the renal functions with the different uh, antiviral uh, drugs, directly antiviral drugs. And here you can see not only sofosfovir based regimens are included, we also have 
Kiribu, we have Amavi Red, Lake Prevere, Preventus Bear, and we have also Dakla, Asuna Prevere, and, and the end result was that directly acting antivirals for HCV infection have comparable efficacy in advanced CKD, and I repeat, advanced CKD patients, and in patients with our CKD, or in patients with early CKD, so it's the same efficacy. And advanced CKD patients in particular had a higher risk of renal function deterioration, anemia and early discontinuation, not only with supposed to bear, but with all the rest of the drugs. So could possibly be due to natural course of the disease, or is it related to other factors? And definitely it is not related to the level of the sopospovera, it's metabolites in the blood. We know that uh, these drugs are associated with other uh, complications, like this is a case report of lupus-like immune complex mediated GN, or like the persistence of uh, cryoglobulinemic GN, uh, or even de novo renal cryoglobulinemia after treatment. And this is a study came from Castellani uh, Hospital. And we have heard about uh, HCC occurrence and recurrence, but at the end of the day, uh, the benefits of using these drugs far outweighs the possible side effects that could happen. So now you know you could treat uh, all your patients in, irrespective of the GFR very efficiently with a drug regimen that you choose according to the, uh, to the points that we, the factors that we have mentioned to choose upon, okay? Now, uh, just before I finish, I'd like to have uh, two points related to, uh, to dialysis patients. So first of all, the screening for the dialysis patients, when to screen is better at time of initial evaluation, but you have to screen at initiation of in-center hemodialysis, and of course we all do that, or a transfer of facility or modality. You can also screen at initiation of PD or initiation of home hemodialysis. When you have to screen, when you evaluate for transplantation and when you have a new infection. Now, how to screen is you do an immunoassay, and if it's positive, then you have to do uh, nucleic acid testing, and if possible, you have to treat. And from now on, you follow up your patients every six months with a PCR, not with the antibodies. If it's negative, then you follow up with the immune assay of every six months. You can also uh, use the ALT at initiation of in-center hemodialysis or transfer from facility, but you take care that uh, the, the, the enzymes in, in our patients do not rise much. So if you have high normal enzymes or just above normal, you have to be very cautious about that. Now, last point is about the prevention of ATV transmission in hemodialysis units. And of course, it's a nosocomial transmission from blood transfusions. The problem is that the window between infectivity where you have a positive PCR and a positive ELISA is around five months. It is also, uh, uh, transferred from external surfaces, from hands of stock, from the use of multi-dose vials or contaminated injectable drugs. So uh, over the years, infectivity of viruses are usually going down because of more and more tests being done for them, including nucleic acid testing in, uh, for HCV and HIV. And in, um, in patients in countries with high income, there is going to be, uh, there, there occurred a market reduction to less than one case per millions of blood uh, units. So we have to avoid blood transfusions as much as we can. Infectivity is correlated to viral load. Uh, after injury with contaminated needles, you get a risk of transmission of 30% for hep B and 3% for hep C, 0.3% for HIV. External surfaces and hands of stuff, you know that uh, you don't really see the blood, so you need a blood detection enhancement, visual enhancement chemical like the luminol. And if you look here, you don't see anything, but after addition of uh, spraying luminol, you can see this uh, blue color. So we have to disinfect the surfaces before uh, all sessions, whether or not we see blood or not. You see, so also the same thing applies for, for the uh, gloves, of course. You can see that here. And uh, you have to take care for hand hygiene and change of gloves uh, between patients and stations. Multi-dose bias, you should not share multi-dose bias like heparin and saline, and uh, contaminated injectable drugs should uh, be prepared in a clean area. And other key points for prevention of nosocomial HCV in hemodialysis patients is that you do not return unused material from contaminated to clean area 
and you have the, to dedicate small items like tourniquet and tape to a single patient. And this is not possible. You will have to disinfect between patients. So the problem, of course, occurs when you have an emergency situation, when you don't have a chance to, to change gloves, for instance. So for prevention of HCV uh, transmission in hemodialysis, uh, the point is infection control practices. This is very important, and this will also help uh, control of other infections, including the coronavirus infections, and doing multiple audits to make sure that these infection control practices are being done. In the guidelines in KDGO, they do not use dedicated machines. They do not isolate patients. They even can reuse uh, the, the dialyzer for the same patient, but we do isolate because we don't apply these measures in all centers as efficiently as should be. And uh, the point is that we have to prioritize uh, adherence to standard infection control practices. We should not primarily rely upon treatment of HCV infection patients. We isolate our patients, and if the patient is uh, HCV uh, positive, uh, he is uh, dialyzed in uh, the positive room, and then he is treated. And end of treatment, we wait for 12 weeks. If the patient becomes negative, he's transferred to the negative room, and if he stays positive, he is back, if he is in the positive room, but uh, these 12 weeks, he could be in an intermediate room. So by clearing infection in those patients, it has proved to improve survival, reduce morbidity, prepare for transplantation, and eliminate an important focus of dissemination. According to the WHO, elimination of HCV as a public health threat is targeting 20, 30, 90% diagnosed, 80% treated, and 65% reduced mortality. So the take-home message is that HCV has significant negative impact on CKD patients. Treatment with directly acting antiviral results in improved survival, reduced morbidity, and elimination of an important focus of infection. Response to antiviral treatment is excellent and is no less than in the general population. Sophosphobare can be used in advanced stage CKD and its use is no more off-label it is now included in the guidelines, but close monitoring is needed in this particular group of patients. HCV transmission can still occur within the hemodialysis units and nosocomial transmission can be reduced by low cost educational interventions. Otherwise, reinfections will occur in hemodialysis units despite cures by highly active, directly acting antiviral regimen. And we should all be aware of the complications of directly acting antivirals. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor May, for this uh, very, very nice presentation, uh, very smooth. And I think it, it illuminates our mind. We'll start the discussion for a couple of minutes and we'll start with Dr. Magd Sherawi. Professor Magd, Fadal. Uh, when I could have a set of, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, so. it's, a very, it's, it's a very nice presentation. Very nice. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. But, but, but I have uh, uh, yes. questions about uh, uh, the coming hepatitis uh, C negative patient after treatment, mm -hmm. and the way of isolation in the LCS unit is very complicated, mm -hmm. according to the guideline of the Ministry of Health. So what happens if you don't have a gray zone or a treated zone, the health uh, uh, facility? What will you do? Will you, will you keep them in hepatitis C positive area or you move them to hepatitis C negative area? Dr. Amai. Um, don't have a place to put it then. Uh, well, bus, uh, it, yani it's all about uh, practicing infection control. If you do practice infection control, you don't even have to separate. So if you want to keep them in, in the positive room, you can, you can do that and you practice infection control, they're not, they will not be reinfected. This is the point. The point okay. is not in isolation as itself, but it is in taking care of what to do with the patients so not, not to spread the infection. But I think that this is a very critical question. Why? I, I totally because it creates, it creates a medical legal problem because the patients can complain that uh, I'm negative now, why I'm not transferred immediately to the negative room, and then this can create headache. So it's better to have intermediate zone before clearing, uh, before giving yes, clearance. Yes, but, but the question is, if you don't have an intermediate zone, you don't have, room, like me, in, in our units, you don't have. For me, so it, it shouldn't I, matter. I'd like to ask Dr. Magdi, 
what what do you do in Ain Shams uh, hemodialysis unit? If you have this uh, in Shams, yes. no, no, no. In Ain Shams, uh, we have a new built unit uh, okay. uh, uh, just opened last October. Okay. So we have a dedicated room for those who are treated. But okay. in other centers, governmental oh. centers, I keep them in hepatitis C positive patient. Oh. I don't move them to negative for two reasons. Yeah. I have no place in hepatitis C negative uh, uh, area because they, they are now we have a lot of hepatitis C negative now that we cannot find a place for them to dialyze. And also because they are still hepatitis C anti antibody positive. So I, I keep them in the, in the same so why, in the same why in some in they some places they were in I know they are treated they yes. don't have hepatitis C but they are still positive when tested this is why in some places they have dedicated area for antibody positive PCR negative individuals until this and in Shams we, yeah. we have now this yes. this area but not all centers have this area Dr Tarat Antawi do you have uh, uh, actually, uh, we have to, uh, uh, for referral to the negative room, we have to mm. wait for three months. Uh, this means that sustained virological response happened, and this means that the patient is cured nearly 100%. With the follow-up of the proper uh, uh, standard precaution uh, for infection, infection mm. control. Dr. Munir Bahgat? Uh, السلام عليكم الاول وعليكم السلام ويلكم دكتور مجدي الشرقاوي اند دكتور منير ربنا يحفظك اند اكشولي ات واز ماي كويستشن بروفيسور مجدي ذا ايشو دكتور طارق از ذا از ذا ذا ويندو بيتوين اند اوف تريتمنت اند ذا ريزلت اوف اس في ار 12 ذير ار 3 مانث از يو نو ان ذيس تايم وي دونت نو بيشنت اوريدي uh, uh, eliminated the virus or not. So where we can put him? Uh, if you still keeping the patient on the uh, HTV positive area, this means you are subject subjecting your patient to reinfection again. But uh, if also you put the patient in HCV negative area, you are not sure that your patient already achieved the uh, sustained virological response. Still, we don't know. So I think if uh, end of treatment, uh, PCR to be done, if the patient is negative, also at this moment, I don't uh, suggest it to be transferred to HCV negative area, but still also we should not put him in the HCV positive. We so the dedicated place, dedicated place as we discussed. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Hussein Fishawi. Hussein Fishawi, Dr. Hussein, Fadl. Professor Fishawi. Uh, I really agree uh, with the opinion. Yes. I really agree with the opinion of Dr. Mubahat. Hello. Uh, yes. Dr. Hussein, Samani. Yes. Come, my dear. Fadl. Samani. Aye, aye. دكتور حسين سامعني؟ ايوه ايوه سامعينك سامعينك انا طبعا اي ام توتال انجرينج وذ ذا اوبينيون اوف دكتور منير باجت ذات يو شود هاف ا بيريد اوف 3 مانثز افتر هافينج ات سيم ذات يو هاف ا ريسبونس توتالي فري افتر 12 ويكس ماشين كان يو هير مي؟ دكتور حسين كان يو هير مي؟ ات سيم ذات كان يو هير مي؟ يس يس حسين can you hear me, Dr. Hussein? Aywa, aywa. I'm saying that I'm agreeing totally. Okay. I'm agreeing totally with Dr. Munir in this opinion. But I have a, a comment in the management in hepatitis C virus, really, because we have two different opinions regarding the grade of evidence in treatment of patient with advanced CKD, GFR below 30, in, uh, in renal patients, of course. As you know that, Mavirate and Zipatir are the drug approved of course, but the ACLD in 2018 was putting both of drugs, the same grade 1B and 1B. In November 2019, they have the same evidence, 1A and 1A, but still the KDU guidelines have put Mavirate superior to Zipatir, and they have graded it in genotype 4 as grade 1B, but, but they have graded 
the pater as grade 2D. So that if you are following the Kido guidelines and we are going to choose the best drug, I think that Mavirate will be the drug of choice. This will be followed by the pater according to the grading evidence in Kido guidelines 2018. And thank you. I think it is wise to follow uh, Professor May uh, approach, the availability yes. the, the, uh, and the efficacy. And I, I want to refer to the, the most recent update in the management of hepatitis C that was released a couple of days ago. Kiduki uh, for Kidigo. So in nice state, they reviewed Kidigo and they have commentary and I think they agreed all about the Kidigo and they put it in a very simple figures. Yes. Uh, so this is in a nice state. Uh, uh, Professor May, uh, do you have, do you want to say anything before moving to Professor Gamal? Yes, I, I, I think what you say is right. You don't have to follow the guidelines and follow the guidelines and follow the guidelines. Okay. Yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes.
and uh, uh, it was also having a significant effect uh, after 10 years and the hepatitis B had also a more significant effect on the uh, graft survival. Uh, more recent studies show that the effect is not that significant. The presence of hepatitis C uh, was really uh, had, having a bit lesser patient survival uh, and uh, a lesser graft survival, but they were not significant. Uh, in many of the studies, the effect was uh, uh, significant, and fewer studies showed that the uh, presence of hepatitis C had no uh, effect uh, on the uh, patient uh, or graft survivors. Uh, uh, other uh, recent data showed that the presence of hepatitis C uh, positivity was significant only in special ethnic groups. Uh, and this was also apparent in the uh, graft survival. Uh, a very important uh, paper was uh, published by our dear colleagues from the Mansoura uh, Center, and uh, they were uh, performing a retrospective analysis of more than uh, 350 cases, and they could show that uh, the presence of hepatitis C had minimal effect on the patient and graft survival, However, it may be a clue for long-term incidence of chronic rejection, so it's more close uh, monitoring of the patients if you have hepatitis C positivity, if you are not going to treat, and the trend now is to treat. Uh, uh, Fontaine in 2019 showed that hepatitis C was significantly affecting the patient's survival, and surprisingly, the hepatitis B virus was not uh, uh, effective or having any influence on the patient's survival. It's almost close to the uh, 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 naive patients uh, and uh, probably due to the better management of the hepatitis B. And the same was also encountered uh, concerning the graft uh, uh, survival. And the KDGU, uh, in its uh, latest recommendation, uh, considered that transplantation would still be the best therapeutic option for uh, CKD, uh, advanced CKD, irrespective of the presence of hepatitis uh, C infection, and the evidence was very high. What is the effect of donor hepatitis uh, C, the donor, if he has hepatitis C or not? I'll speak first about a few reports concerning the hepatitis C in the positive living donor. This has been originally a contraindication for transplantation, but in several reports, they considered treating these uh, uh, donors with the uh, regimen which is available. And after establishing a sustained viral response, the recipient was administered a treatment protocol for 12 weeks. So it's a prophylactic protocol by treating the recipient as well after establishing a sustained viral response in the donor. Other reports did a bit different approach where they considered treating the, uh, the donor and after sustain, uh, achieving a sustained viral response, they performed the transplantation, but they did not give treatment to the recipient and was only following up for any occurrence of uh, viremia. And uh, they uh, could demonstrate that uh, uh, the recipients uh, did not have any uh, infection uh, uh, after one year follow-up. Uh, and this uh, could show that there is a survival advantage with receiving a kidney from an anti-HCV positive donor versus uh, remaining on the waiting list. And this reminds me with, the, uh, with our previous initial practice when we uh, used to uh, give positive antibody before we have the NAT uh, era to uh, uh, an antibody positive similar to the uh, approach we are doing with the CMV uh, detection. Uh, and uh, uh, supplying uh, organs from positive donors was considered by Jadul in 2017 that it uh, increased the availab availability of HCV grafts and may markedly shorten the wait uh, time for transplantation. 
And uh, it was considered that uh, transplanting from positive, uh, probably this is more in cadaveric, uh, transplanting from positive HCV net positive donors to net positive recipients has been generally accepted as a standard care not requiring further study. And this is published in 2020. But I, uh, and, uh, and this is probably increasing the kidney donor profile index. But I still believe that this is a, still a premature decision to consider and to adopt. Uh, transplantation from anti-H, which is here speaking about the antibody detection, anti-HCV positive donor into recipient with uh, pre-transplantation HCV infection, uh, this might still uh, uh, be a source of reinfection and might, uh, might be a source of super infection. And this might add to the topic of uh, the previous discussion about leaving uh, patients who were cured from hepatitis C by treatment in the uh, positive uh, zone for a long period. And I believe they can be tested only for three months. And if they prove to be negative, they should be quickly transferred uh, to either a gray zone or to a negative zone. Uh, here, if we uh, consider the HCV infective kidney transplant recipients who received grafts from either a positive or a negative donor, does it differ or not? Does it have any uh, consequences or not? And in both situations, the uh, positive recipient, whether receiving a graft from a positive donor or a negative donor, will receive a direct acting uh, and, uh, antiviral therapy and they usually have a very excellent response. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, the response is even reaching 100%, similar to the general population with hepatitis C who receive uh, 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 direct acting antiviral therapy. In this study by uh, Cohen in 2017, he studied the effect of uh, transplanting positive recipients with either uh, uh, HCV be negative donor versus uh, transplanting them from HCV positive donor. Does it have any difference or not? In either situations, they are going to receive direct acting antiviral therapy. He noticed that the presence of HCV positivity in the donor significantly reduces the uh, uh, patient survival and significantly reduces the uh, graft survival. This was also, also documented by Hugh uh, uh, et al. in 2017, who documented that uh, uh, HCV positive don donors uh, uh, impact uh, an, uh, an important effect on the patient and the graft uh, survival. And uh, the difference is significant. So it's not only a sustained viral response, and we should manage the occurrence of hepatitis C among the recipient and among the donor as well as a considerable risk factor, and we should search for other immunological imprints or epigenetic imprints which might be impacting on the immune system uh, of the recipient uh, and having uh, its effect on the long-term outcome. What about the post-transplantation risks with HCV? Uh, there was a considerable higher, higher risk uh, in uh, uh, patients with HCV in the first uh, three or six months after transplantation. But uh, performing transplantation confirmed a long-term survival advantage if we could bypass this risky very early uh, period. And uh, uh, Ross has uh, compared the uh, outcome in the uh, early post-operative period with the uh, general population, which is the dark uh, line in the middle, mm -hmm. and compared it with the long-term uh, survival uh, curves. And he noticed a greater risk of mortality in the first six months if compared to those who remain on uh, dialysis and not performing uh, dialysis. But if we could bypass the initial risky period, there is a long-term uh, patient survival benefit uh, better than the uh, dialysis population or if they are left on the waiting list. This is probably related to the higher risk of uh, infections and uh, uh, considering the uh, higher possibility of tuberculosis and opportunistic uh, infection in the early post-operative uh, period. This is more uh, clear in the first three months particularly if they have received uh, induction therapy with anti or uh, basiliximab. 
It is important to notice that the uh, patients with hepatitis C uh, positive, uh, positivity and receiving uh, direct antiviral treatment after transplantation, they have a considerable helper to suppressor ratio activity if compared to the uh, other negative uh, uh, transplant recipients. Uh, 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 there is an important uh, effect of the treatment uh, considering the uh, immunological uh, parameters and immunological print, and probably uh, Professor Fushawi will uh, elaborate on this more. And you can consider that uh, clearance of the viral by successful direct act antiviral treatment induces recovery of the HCV-specific CD8 T cells so uh, this would uh, result in a, a greater probability of de novo glomerulonephritis and de novo extrahepatic manifestations uh, uh, related to the clearance of the virus. And uh, Professor May has elaborated on the study of uh, Cairo University of de novo cryoglobulinemia and de novo glomerulonephritis occurring after treatment. And this might occur as well after transplantation. So it's preferable to uh, relate the treatment or to consider the treatment of the patients before uh, transplantation rather than delaying it for that possibility. Moreover, uh, we, uh, we can encounter normalization of the natural killer cell activity after treatment, and this would result in a, a, an active immune system with the probability of uh, uh, occurrence of sensitization and donor-specific antibody reactions. So we, uh, we can encounter, in addition to the infections, uh, 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 de novo uh, HCV-related glomerulonephritis, in addition to the other extrahepatic manifestations after transplantation in the form of uh, new onset diabetes after transplantation, and the longer term, a higher possibility of uh, uh, neoplasia in the long term. Uh, in this study by Hugh uh, in 2017, he could demonstrate a significant effect uh, or impact of infections, particularly in the uh, early post-operative period. Uh, uh, moreover, he would encounter uh, uh, just uh, uh, insignificant relation to occurrence of malignancy, but there was a significant uh, relation to the occurrence of or recurrence of the original disease in among uh, hepatitis C positive patients who were treated uh, in the early post-operative uh, uh, period. Uh, uh, following transplantation, we can encounter several extrahepatic uh, complications. As I mentioned previously, uh, infections is one of the most important uh, early postoperative complications, uh, in addition to the possibility of having de novo glomerulonephritis and occurrence of acute uh, rejection. Uh, uh, concerning the hepatic complications, uh, encountered among these patients in the very early post-operative period, we can encounter the possibility of the fibrosing cholangiohepatitis, and in the long term, uh, there might be a, a, a tendency to higher incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, there might be a complication related to the direct acting antiviral themselves. Uh, which is used in the uh, early post-operative period, and very frequently we encounter uh, a, a deterioration of the kidney function, which might be transient in most of the cases, among other side effects of the drugs might be a bit more if you give the treatment after transplantation, as compared to the, those who are treated on uh, dialysis before transplantation. Uh, the impact of direct acting antiviral uh, on the occurrence of acute region donor specific antibody formation has been uh, studied by uh, Ziad et al. in 2018. And uh, he uh, encountered uh, uh, among a follow up period of about two years a significant uh, uh, increase or in a higher incidence of uh, subclinical rejection in 25% of cases, and it was particularly antibody-mediated rejection in 80% of those uh, uh, studied. Uh, if we uh, uh, try to uh, evaluate the impact of induction therapy on the outcome in SV positive uh, cases, definitely using uh, ATG induction improves the patient survival uh, in the long term, and here the five-year patient survival is significantly uh, better in SV positive cases who received ATG induction than those who did not receive ATG induction. 
This also was uh, clear uh, in the graft survival uh, uh, five years uh, of follow-up. Uh, those who received ATG had a better uh, outcome. And uh, uh, Morales uh, considered that all immunosuppressive drugs can be used in HCV positive patients, but he uh, uh, mentioned that uh, if we can avoid routine use of ATG, it would be better to avoid the early critical uh, risk of HCV uh, uh, induced infection tendency in the first three months. The category recommendations made it a bit, uh, 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 a bit uh, not very clear, but they considered that all conventional current induction and maintenance immunosuppressive resumes can be used, but the uh, evidence is not that strong. Uh, we can now move to an important uh, issue of uh, uh, interaction between uh, the direct active antivirals we are going to use postoperatively and the immunosuppressive agents we are going uh, to be giving to our uh, patients. If you concentrate on this slide, it's complicated, but follow uh, it up with me step by step. In the middle, when we uh, take the direct active antiviral, uh, uh, it will uh, be absorbed and the absorption process will, un will undergo three important steps. At the beginning, there are uh, transporters and the, uh, one of the important uh, transporters is, is the organic ana anion transporter, uh, which is passing the drug from the luminal to the basolateral uh, uh, side of the cell. But during its passage uh, through the uh, enterocytes, uh, it is subject to uh, enzymatic degradation by the cytochrome P uh, system, and we have many uh, uh, isotypes of this cytochrome system, and also it is uh, uh, liable to an, uh, a counter, ca uh, counter transporter system, which is the glycoprotein transporter, which will return the drug from the enterocyte to the uh, uh, gut lumen. But at the end, we have a net transport of almost less than 50% of the drug which is swallowed. If you now move with me to the left side of the, of the slide, where the uh, drug passes through the uh, portal circulation to uh, the liver, and the liver, uh, it will still uh, be transported by the glycoprotein transporter to the hepatocyte and the biliary uh, uh, system to be excreted in the gut again, and the uh, glycoprotein transporter is an excretory uh, transporter. Also in the hepatocyte, it is uh, subject to uh, enzymatic degradation by the cytochrome P45 uh, uh, system here, it is the C type, and by the uh, organo, uh, organic anion transporter, we get a final transport to the circulation, and we have uh, uh, almost less than 25% of the uh, uh, taken drug, which will be available for the systemic effect of the direct acting antiviral. Uh, and uh, according to the various uh, 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 transporter system and enzymatic system, which is uh, liable to affect the direct acting antiviral, we can get the net uh, interaction with the immunosuppressive agents. And we should consider if the uh, uh, drug is uh, liable to uh, transportation by the absorptive organo organic anion transporter or by the excretory uh, uh, glycoprotein transporter and which form of cytochrome degrading enzyme it is liable to be metabolized through. We get the net result according to uh, each uh, direct acting viral liable to which of these transporter or enzymatic degradation system. As an example, the Simeprevir utilizes both organic anion transporter and the glycoprotein transporter, as well at, uh, as degradation by the cytochrome P3A. Co-administration of cyclosporin. Uh, which is a potent uh, inhibitor of the cytochrome P3E4, would result in reduced degradation of the drug. And as well, uh, cyclosporin is a glycoprotein inhibitor as well, which is uh, uh, the excretory, uh, uh, it reduces the excretion of, uh, of the, the drug and the absorption is enhanced by the use of cyclosporin. And we get a six-fold increase in semiprevere available in the systemic circulation. So we need to monitor uh, the, the drug dosage 
with combination with uh, various immunosuppressive uh, agents. And it's recommended that uh, uh, co-administration with sofosfovir, which is not metabolized by cytochrome P system, which is a different situation, would result in no dose adjustments. And it's important to consider that with such regimens, uh, a drug, for example, like rifampicin, which is a potent inducer of the glyc protein, uh, which induces the excretion and uh, avoids the absorption, would definitely re result in a much lower level of the drug and lesser absorption. So it is not recommended to be co-administered in any uh, uh, patients who are receiving or co-administrating uh, direct acting antiviral with cyclosporin, for example. Uh, other drugs, for example, as uh, tolipravir and bosipravir, uh, 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 they uh, uh, have a, a different effect on uh, enhancing the absorption. And for example, the tacrolimus level may be increased uh, 70-fold with telaprevir and 17-fold increase with bosipravir. And the tacrolimus drug level might, um, in various individuals, according to the uh, uh, different enzymatic representation, uh, might not be affected by the co-administration of the direct acting antiviral, or it might uh, be increased, or it might be decreased. So it requires very close follow-up while we are uh, uh, co-administrating the direct acting antiviral with immunosuppressive agents. And you can have a, a lot of uh, uh, tables demonstrating the safety, which are green uh, uh, colored boxes uh, with the co-administration of the direct act antiviral you are administrating with immunosuppression, or you can require close follow-up, which are yellow, or you can have uh, contraindication, which are the red boxes. Uh, also, the, you have uh, programs, which uh, uh, is well demonstrated in the drug-drug uh, uh, interaction uh, tables. Uh, and if you introduce, for example, the immunosuppressive agent with the direct act viral you are choosing, you can get a recommendation of using or not using the combination. In this table, it summarizes the, uh, the uh, uh, interactions of the different or the famous immunosuppressive agents with the uh, famous uh, 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 direct act antivirals. And you can notice that sofosfovir, uh, uh, sofosfovir is uh, safe to be used with all the immunosuppressive agents we are uh, generally using. Uh, and uh, daclatasvir, ledipsvir, and velpatasvir are uh, safe to be used with uh, all of them, but needs to be uh, monitored with uh, everolimus. But it is uh, uh, to be noticed that simeprevir, uh, partipavir, ombetasvir, dasabavir, and grazupavir are uh, not to be used in uh, uh, combination with uh, several immunosuppressives and to be used with caution uh, if we are uh, uh, forced uh, to use them. Uh, uh, Esforzado uh, in 2019 demonstrated that the antiproliferatives are safe to be used with most of the uh, uh, direct acting antivirals, while tacrolimus and the emitors uh, uh, can be used with close monitoring but it is important to notice that cyclosporin is better to be avoided and not prescribed with many of the uh, uh, direct acting antiviral. But it is important that if we are going to have cyclosporin as the available immunosuppressive agents in particular uh, areas, example in areas which are uh, recently introducing transplantation and you don't have except cyclosporin, that you can use the sophos for wear uh, uh, regimens safely without need of monitoring. So it might be uh, the, the possible choice uh, in that uh, in these areas, particularly those with low socioeconomic standards, to uh, and are going to treat uh, hepatitis C after transplantation. Jadul in 2017 mentioned that uh, uh, in CKD patients uh, with estimated uh, GFR more than 30 can be treated with any licensed direct acting antiviral regimen. Uh, in this study performed by the uh, Asraeni group, which was led by our dear professor uh, Rashad Barsoum, and uh, was uh, also led by uh, Professor Maya Hasaballa and Professor Hussein Al-Fishawi, they considered the treatment uh, uh, after transplantation 
uh, according to the GFR, and this paper was uh, published in 2016 and probably might uh, need uh, a rehearsal by 2020. They consider that if you have a GFR, which is more than 30 milliliters per minute, the uh, sophosphere containing regimen, the harmony, is still uh, uh, effective. And uh, actually, sophosphere is uh, cheap and available in many countries uh, uh, worldwide. But if we have uh, a GFR, which is less than 30 milliliters per minute, the daglatosphere and the sovaldi would be uh, the preferred uh, regimen. Uh, at last, I will pass through the treatment strategies after uh, transplantation, when to treat and how to treat uh, the patients. Uh, the most recent uh, uh, update of the American Association for uh, Study of Liver Diseases in 11, 2019, uh, considered that uh, uh, post-kidney transplantation treatment of all genotypes from one to six, with or without compensated cirrhosis, might be uh, considered by sophosphere related regimens or having containing regimens, either in combination with uh, ledipasvir or with vilbatasvir, and uh, uh, the duration of treatment is 12 weeks. Another important regimen is the uh, combination of glisaprevir and uh, pebrinatasvir for 12 weeks uh, as well. For those who have uh, uh, a previous uh, attack or have a, a, a direct antiviral uh, acting antiviral experience regimen uh, in the past, still sofosfovir containing regimen is the uh, base uh, with the velbatasvir, but you add a third drug, which is the voxilapavir, with or without uh, ribavirin for uh, 12 weeks. Uh, you can still use the ribavirin uh, according to the body weight as shown in the table, and you should also consider the, the GFR to uh, uh, monitor the dose or uh, uh, change the dose of ribavirin according the, to the GFR of uh, the patient. Uh, uh, Lubetsky uh, uh, could uh, demonstrate the safety of, of treatment of hepatitis C in kidney transplant uh, recipients, and he could uh, study the effect on uh, 31 uh, patients, and he could uh, notice that three patients had an impaired kidney function, uh, uh, which was temporary, and uh, in uh, 31, uh, and in six of the 31 patients, they had uh, a worsening of the proteinuria related to the uh, uh, period of uh, treatment. And uh, we, uh, this is a repeated slide again where you can uh, see a direct effect of the direct act and viral on renal function. Uh, you can get uh, impairment of the kidney function, which is usually transient. Uh, in this uh, study of uh, Lubitsky, he could demonstrate that proteinuria uh, increases, but insignificantly and he could not demonstrate any significant effect on the production of DSA or panel-reactive uh, antibodies. Uh, the proteinuria can uh, be stable uh, in some patients, can be increasing uh, in others, but uh, definitely it will be transient and will improve definitely after the end of the treatment. And the KDGO recommendations uh, uh, mention that uh, direct active antiviral therapy either before or after transplantation is safe, but uh, this is the, the data which, uh, which are available uh, uh, in the study uh, analysis. Uh, treating the patients uh, before transplantation uh, would uh, uh, stop the progression of the liver disease. Uh, would uh, uh, reduce the possibility of de novo glomerulonephritis after transplantation and reduce the risk of uh, other complications, uh, including uh, the new onset diabetes after transplantation, as well as the other extrahepatic manifestations. And the benefits of treating uh, the patients after transplantation is that we uh, reduce the wait time and we increase the organ utilization available, particularly in uh, disease donation. This is a very important algorithm uh, according to the availability of donors. If we have a living donor 
and we have no constraint, we have no time constraint, and the donor can wait. So it's preferable to treat the patient uh, uh, before kidney transplantation. But if we have a living donor and we have a time constraint, the donor cannot uh, wait until the patient uh, get uh, his uh, course of treatment. So we can proceed with the treatment after transplantation. Uh, uh, and this is related to the availability of the uh, living donor and the duration uh, uh, available. But if we don't have a living donor, so we are going to uh, uh, have a donor from the waiting list in the cataphoric program. So whether to treat before or after, if we have a, a, a HCV positive kidney directly available, and there are no extra hepatic uh, manifestations in the recipient, uh, it's better to proceed with transplantation and consider HCV treatment after kidney transplantation. But if we have no available positive kidney uh, and there, uh, there are uh, extra hepatic manifestations, it's uh, preferable to uh, treat the patient before kidney transplantation and later on put him on the waiting list. And the, this slide, it considers the situation of the recipient himself according to the liver uh, pathology. And if we have uh, the fibro test and the fibro score between uh, F0 and F3, or if we have F4 and the portal venous uh, pressure is less than 10 millimeter mercury, we should consider putting the, the, uh, the patient on the waiting list to receive the first uh, uh, deceased organ. But uh, on the contrary, if we have uh, F4 and the portal venous pressure uh, above 10 millimeter mercury, and particularly have uh, uh, definite cirrhosis, we should consider the patient for combined liver and kidney transplantation. When to start the treatment? The, the basic protocol is the delayed initiation, which is considered by various uh, authors, including Molnar and Capella, uh, uh, to start the antiviral treatment two months at least after uh, uh, transplantation, which is the regimen which is adopted in, in our Egyptian protocols, basically. Uh, so they consider treatment after two months uh, receiving the graft. Uh, in this Chinese uh, study by Sharma, uh, he compared it uh, to other uh, available uh, studies worldwide in the United States and in Europe. And uh, he, he, studied, he compared his evaluation with uh, various studies in these areas. And uh, uh, the onset of treatment was more than two years up to 12 years after transplantation. Uh, uh, so this demonstrates that we should not leave the patient, even if he was not uh, diagnosed previously, or if he uh, developed a de novo uh, HTV infection after transplantation, he is still candidate for direct acting antiviral treatment, regardless of the timing of the transplantation. And he could notice that the rapid viral response, which occurs after one month or four weeks of starting treatment, or the uh, end of treatment, the whole ETR, will RVR, will end of treatment 12 weeks responses, as well as the sustained viral responses, very successful in all these uh, studies. Another protocol considers uh, a, a very early initiation of the drug, or it is mentioned to be the preemptive uh, approach. Uh, uh, there are two main uh, approaches in this preemptive uh, initiation, either the expand, expander one trial or the CC trial. CC uh, uh, It considers treatment of day uh, zero. Uh, uh, after receiving the uh, graft immediately, uh, or they call it on call to operation room initiation. Uh, also, we have another approach which the thinker study, uh, which uh, starts the treatment with the onset of viremia. They keep monitoring for the occurrence of viremia in the first week until this occurs by day three, and then they would start direct acting antiviral. Uh, uh, regimen. Another uh, approach is the prophylactic initiation, 
which starts the treatment minus 12 hours. And you can notice that all these are in disease uh, program uh, transplantation, where they start the, the uh, direct active antiviral, not on day zero, but minus 12 hours. And they consider a very short course of treatment for only seven days. But in addition to this, they add ezetimib, which is a HCB entry blocker, which is one of the uh, host targeting agents. And this is a completely different approach in treatment and a completely different uh, lecture. In uh, uh, those who considered day zero treatment, they uh, revised the uh, viral uh, load. Uh, it started as well to increase by day one and uh, was completely uh, controlled uh, by the end of the treatment. And by at the end of treat, the, the, the HCV uh, tetris was undetectable and the sustained viral response was uh, perfect uh, after 12 weeks. And needless to mention that we had a, a, an excellent uh, rapid viral response, which is by the end of the first month. The kidney function was also perfect uh, uh, by the day zero protocol. And by the end of treatment and by the uh, end of the follow-up period, we had a very good kidney function. Needless to say that we encountered few cases who had a, a, a minimal rise, which is a transient rise of the serum creatinine, probably related to the uh, toxic effect of the direct active antiviral, or probably an immunologic response uh, in relation to the activation of the uh, immune system by the effect of uh, the uh, treatment. And I am sure Professor Fishawi will elaborate on this. Uh, in the protocols uh, which start the uh, treatment uh, uh, on day three on the occurrence of viremia, still, still we had a, a very uh, rapid response before the first month, which is by the uh, end of the, uh, the first month, which is the rapid viral response. And we had uh, uh, minimal complications. And in this uh, study of uh, Sisi et al. by in 2020, there was no uh, adverse effects, but astonishingly, we could encounter the renal vein thrombosis in four out of uh, eight cases studied, and you consider it unrelated, and this is a bit questionable to have 50% incidence and consider it unrelated. For the early or preemptive protocols, it is important to consider that the authors reported an increased incidence of CMV viremia, uh, they uh, encountered an increased incidence of uh, BK viremia. They also encountered an increase in the development of the de novo DSA, probably related to the enhanced immune response by the activation of the uh, helper cells, as I previously mentioned. And there was a tendency for fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis. And it is considered to, to not to adopt this very early preemptive protocol to allow these complications to appear and probably to treat them before starting the direct acting antiviral. And the decision for the uh, uh, preference for delayed initiation uh, would uh, uh, allow us uh, to detect these unexpected uh, consequences to occur and be treated. And there is an important insurance uh, issue uh, which will have a conflict if we have uh, uh, in this uh, complications by the direct acting antiviral without detecting them uh, without the uh, co-administration of the treatment. So uh, it's preferable to delay the treatment to the second or the third month. Also, the clinical staff would require approved uh, evidence-based protocols, uh, avoiding the conflict of uh, occurrence of uh, uh, antibody-mediated rejections, DSA, or CMV infection. If we revise the slide again, and this is a repeated slide again, the transplantation of kidney from HCV positive, net positive donor, HCV uh, infected recipient with post-transplanted DA direct act and viral therapy uh, as accepted as a standard of care, not requiring further study. I think that this is, uh, uh, would be considering increasing the kidney donor profile index, but I definitely uh, believe that uh, still premature and uh, still questionable to adopt this uh, procedure without very close monitoring and uh, careful detection of the complications. 
uh, are we ready for this prime time for uh, using hepatitis C positive uh, dose, particularly to, uh, to uh, uninfected recipients is still uh, questionable. And in conclusion, allow me to share you the, the uh, final uh, aspects that negative donor to negative recipient carries the best outcome. Uh, treatment of hepatitis C recipients pre-transplantation is the ideal and most safe, particularly if we have extra hepatic manifestations or primary uh, glomerulonephritis. Uh, also, treatment of hepatitis C positive transplantation by the direct acting as a virus is feasible, efficient, and uh, reasonably safe, at least in the uh, uh, parameters which we are following up but we need to uh, revise the immunologic imprint and the epigenetic imprint on complications. Positive donor to positive recipient is acceptable and for evaluation. And in the previous eras, we used uh, to have a positive antibody to a positive uh, antibody recipient as a considerable approach. But here we, they are considering a NAT positive or PCR positive donor to a PCR positive recipient and uh, treatment after transplantation. Uh, positive donor to negative recipient is not absolutely contraindicated, but needs to be still re-evaluated. Uh, this is uh, a photo of myself where, where I was visiting China for the uh, China International uh, Organ Donation uh, Conference, which was held uh, in December 2019. And this is in Kunming, Yunnan, China. And uh, uh, this is Yunnan, not Yuhan. Okay. And uh, there is a nice lake where you can see a lot of birds going around uh, from one person to the other and people feeding them. And this, if you have any sort of infection, particularly avian, uh, would be a very important source of infection transmission. This is in 7 December, while I was sharing the session with Chinese and Korean colleagues. Also, this is a view in the meeting with the beautiful Chinese girls. And when we were visiting the hospitals for organ transplantation, and this was in 8 December 2019, and this is in the main square in Kunming, China, 8 December 2019. And this is in the food course in, uh, in Yunnan, 8 December 2019, uh, 2019 as well. And you can see all the food stuff they are using from seafood sources. And uh, uh, the first case was the believed of COVID was believed to be occurring in uh, November. Uh, but the official statement of the Chinese uh, recorded the occurrence of the first case in China to be on 8th 8, 8th of December. It was in Hubei province in Wuhan, which is a two hours flight distance from Yunnan. And uh, you need to have environmental uh, uh, recognition of where you are so that you cannot use the uh, original tools you are using and you can use the uh, Chinese uh, tools for feeding. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Gamal, for this very nice and full of uh, questions and algorithms. Thank you very much. You, may, you, you, you make it very clear. And I'm happy that you are uh, conservative regarding accepting HCV donor, uh, HCV positive kidneys to HCV negative one, because in the past you were more energetic. I think you changed your opinion a little bit. Am I clear? Am, yes. I, am I right? Yes, 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 sure, sure, yeah. sure. Because here in, at, at Mansoura, we are very conservative. Even if, uh, if the patient is antibody positive, PCR negative, we should think uh, before giving acceptance to proceed for transplantation. And uh, I'm sure that there is a great difference between cadaveric and the living donor kidney transplantation. So the rules that can be followed in cadaveric, it is, uh, I think it is not straight to be applied in living donor kidney transplantation. Uh, and I like to have some questions and comments from the audience, please, if you have any questions. We can start with uh, Professor Ahmed Adam. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be, uh, you are hearing me, all right? Yes, yeah? yes, yes. 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 Uh, I enjoyed the lecture of Professor Saadi so much. I missed uh, 
most of the lecture of uh, Professor Mai because of technical error in you my mi computer. You missed a lot. <laughs> yes, I know that. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. uh, just a short question to Professor Sadi. If you uh, rush to transplant a patient uh, uh, with hepatitis C as a recipient, what is the best time to initiate uh, the direct acting agents post transplant? And uh, does it depend on the, your immunosuppressive protocol? Uh, I don't believe it will be related to the immunosuppressive protocol, and I believe we should adopt the delayed initiation uh, approach, which is minimum of two months after a transplantation. Uh, to uh, give the time for the uh, 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 any complications which would have appeared in the early uh, period uh, to be managed, particularly if we have CMV or we uh, want to have CMV prophylaxis uh, to be given. Uh, if we bypass this uh, early two months period, we can initiate it in the second or third months, uh, which will be most feasible. But I believe that this is depend on the success of the transplant and how the transplant will behave, not to initiate it if the transplant is not in the steady state. Uh, that, that's what I'm saying, that we need to be stable in the first two months. And when the patient is stable without having any complications of rejection, of infection, of uh, uh, any other uh, complications, uh, we need to start after uh, the patient is is stabilized in the first two months. I agree with you. Thank you but very much. But if the patient has uh, immediate post-transplant acute hepatitis and it is uh, the flare of hepatitis C, I think we can treat by direct antiviral earlier than uh, waiting. Uh, uh, th yeah. Uh, this is a different approach, Professor yes. Hassan, and thank you for, for mentioning it. If we have a, a flare of the hepatitis, we will shift to the management of hepatitis C in, in the concept of glomenophritis, which yes. Professor al we will elaborate on. And by that time, we need to immediately uh, start the direct acting antiviral with, with uh, prompt immunosuppression, and we might increase the immunosuppression targeting the uh, suppression of the glomerulonephritis and the extrahepatic manifestations. This is a, a different uh, issue than having a stable patient, which is Professor uh, Adam is considering. Uh, uh, this is a, a different situation. Similar to if you develop a, a de novo cryoglobulinemia uh, at the transplantation, you will need to immediately uh, treat it uh, at the time it appears. Uh, needless to say, uh, Professor Hassin, and thank you very much for your uh, uh, elaboration on this point, that if you have a, a, a thrombotic microangiopathic uh, uh, effect uh, uh, and uh, uh, glomerulopathy related to the TMA, you will need to manage it immediately by plasma pharesis and initiation of the direct act antiviral treatment uh, uh, immediately. You should not wait any time. But as a, 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 a routine prophylactic uh, approach is preferable to be delayed. Okay. Is there any questions from the audience? We have another experience here, Professor Gamal, regarding drug interactions. Because in uh, since a couple of years, we used Corivo with calcium inhibitors, with tacrolimus. And we got the lesson that this is a very bad combination. And this is why we stopped this combination and respected the guidelines. It is impossible to combine Quirivo with Tacrolimus because in this era, the patient was receiving Tacrolimus uh, half milligram every week or every two weeks. So how, how can we manipulate immune suppression and how to respect the level? So it's very difficult. So Quirivo plus Tacrolimus is a contraindicated combination. Like, Elbaz, uh, like uh, uh, the Grasobrevir, Elbazvir, with cyclosporin, it is completely contraindicated and to be avoided. And I want to add only one point here in the drug drug interactions. We should be careful even after ending the treatment, after the, uh, the patient be becomes uh, clear of the virus, because after clearance of virus, liver uh, functions improve, metabolism improves, so, so the patient may metabolize a calcium inhibitor more aggressive. So we should keep monitoring the uh, calcium inhibitor frequently even 
after the end of uh, antiviral treatment. The last point is when we treat the patient by diet antiviral, uh, we should give a look at hepatitis B. Professor Gamal. Sure, sure. Sure, yeah, I, I fully agree with you that the very close monitoring of the drug levels, particularly it, it might differ from one patient to the other. And I showed you that the uh, acronyms level might be increased 70 folds in, in some uh, cases by the uh, various combinations. And you need to modify the uh, combination treatment and the drug uh, you are choosing for treatment of the hepatitis according to the uh, 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 response of the patient and the regimen which is available as well. Thank you very much, Professor Gamal, for, for your excellent presentation. A lot of questions and the answers were very clear. Thank you very much. And now, and now we'll move to Professor Munir Bahgat, just to change from nephrology to hepatology. And I think you will, uh, uh, would you please, Professor Gamal, stop the chair on your side? Uh, you, you want me to, to uh, respond to the uh, Professor Munir, okay? Uh, stop the chair uh, to allow him to share his slide. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Dr. Munir. Thank you now. Oh, yes, you please. I, I think you, you, you'll have a short time for, for your comments. I, and I know, one of the important points that we want to hear from you is the how to evaluate uh, liver uh, is liver biopsy mandatory or non-invasive evaluation by elastography uh, or fibro scan is enough uh, this is one of the points that we want to hear from you as a pathologist how to uh, evaluate if, liver status if you if you want we can go by uh, through questions no problem okay, okay. Uh, if you have if the you slides to... please share I, your slides yeah no I problem have slides. okay uh, you, you can see now the slide? Still. No, share. I shared. No, uh, open and minimize the, the presentation and then open it from the Zoom meeting. Mohammed Al Hadidi can help you. Mohammed. Uh, uh, Professor Munir, I think you should open the presentation first and I then. Open the presentation. Yeah, yeah, open it first and then uh, click on the upper toolbar, the toolbar on the top of your screen. Uh, choose uh, uh, share content and then select the browse, uh, browser uh, screen and then you will choose your uh, your presentation. افتح افتح السلايدز يا دكتور منير وصغرها مينيمايز وافتحها من الشير اللي عندك. اه اه يس يس اوكي. اوكي. So first I will open the slides. Open the slides وبعدين صغرها مينيمايز نزلها تحت. وبعدين دوس على الشير بطن اللي عندك في الزوم وافتحها من الشير لما تشوفها يعني نوت فول سكرين جاست ذا سلايد ذا سمول وان اه اوكي نص ناو اه معلش ناو يو كان سي ناو نو نو زين Already he, he asked me to post share or already it seems that it is shared. Yeah, Dr. Munir, you opened the PowerPoint? Yes, it's open. And uh, you do minimize? Yani minimize. It means that you can see the negative. Ah, okay, minimize now. You can see it below. And then from the share button, you can see it on the share. And you can see it from the share after you see it on the share. Okay. I get the point. Is it clear now? No. No. No share. PowerPoint. Oh, ah, yes, this one. Share. Clear now? No share. Share, have you got a presentation? Have you got a share? Have you got a share? Have you got a presentation? Have you got a share? اضغط على شير انا اخترت شير اوريدي نيو شير جميل جميل البرزنتيشن اللي عند حضرتك اضغط عليه ان شاء الله حتى دبل كليك ذيس وات اي ديد اكشولي هو على فكره انا لاحظت حتى السلايدز دكتوره مي ودكتور ما حدش ما شفتش انا السلايدز اصلا اي ديدنت خلاص اوكي دكتور منير سو وي كان وي كان ديسكاس ويز يو وي كان ديسكاس فيو كويشنز 
uh, uh, the, the first question is uh, as, as hepatologist uh, yeah. is the liver biopsy now obsolete in the majority of cases because we hear this statement from American sort of nephrology presentation last year that nowadays we can evaluate uh, liver status by uh, fibro scan and uh, elastography. What about this point? Is it right or uh, need some modification? No, no, I, I agree with that. Uh, now we are not doing a liver biopsy at all for any HCV patient. Just because Dr. Hussein, any HCV positive patient, antibody and HCV RNA is candidate for treatment. Then okay. the decision will depend upon the status of the liver. This can easily be assessed by all what we are doing from the lab test and uh, ultrasound. And if in question, we can sometimes request fiber scan, but no more liver based. Okay. So the, 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 uh, you, you don't need biopsies nowadays for evaluation no. of liver. Okay. So what about the, the modifications done by Egyptian uh, Ministry of Health regarding treating hepatitis C? in our community. Okay. Yeah. See, um, actually we received from uh, the NCCVH uh, or the National Committee for Control of uh, Viral Hepatitis, Lagnal uh, um, the latest guideline by, uh, issued by them in the last year. But what I want to say, this guideline, I sure, I'm sure that most of you will not agree with it. Uh, because there is actually some improvement after that. But what we receive is that we look for the uh, uh, EGFR. We know that EGFR in, CKD, in uh, hepatic patients better to be calculated by the API uh, uh, equation. And if the EGFR above 20 patients not on dialysis, uh, we, of course, use the Furibo plus uh, ribavirin for 12 weeks, or if the patient cannot tolerate ribavirin, we can give Curivo for 24 weeks. Uh, to be honest, now Curivo actually is not much available in the market in, the, in Asia. But fortunately, we have now uh, uh, similar to Ebicloza. Ebicloza is Sufisbuvir plus Vilbatasvir. And uh, actually, I enjoyed what uh, Professor May said, uh, as if like she was uh, uh, not only a nephrologist, she was actually a hepatologist. When <laughs> she gave, gave a, 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 a clear statement how to remember the uh, nomenclature of each of the three main categories used as best. Protease inhibitor start by letter P for pen, and so any drug end by pre there, pre there is belonging to protease inhibitor category. And five, uh, not, not non-structural, five A, A, uh, all drugs end by S there, S there. And non-structural five B, all uh, before book, all drugs end by bovir. Uh, I'm always actually telling my students like that, and I actually was surprised when a nephrologist says that also it means she's uh, 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 elegant professor actually and elegant scientist. Anyhow, what 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 we can know from this? We know that protease inhibitors, all drugs ending by pre-there, pre-there, cannot be used in decompensated cirrhosis. We are treating either child A or child B. If the patient is a child A, we can use even a Curibo, no problem. But if the patient is a child B, we cannot use Curibo. Nowadays, we can uh, use uh, Ebicloza or Sufus Bouvier, uh, Velpa test B, because it is composed of Sufus Bouvier, which is B inhibitor, uh, 5B, and Velpa test there, S there means it is 5A. So it, it didn't include protease inhibitor. But we should uh, tell you that there is another drug available also now uh, by the NCCVH we have already, which is Vudivi. 
Vozidi similar to the closure, plus it contains also voxilla prevail. So being having voxilla prevail, prevail means it is protease inhibitor. So Vozidi cannot be given also for patient with child B. So the guideline which was elaborated by the NCCVH if the patient with child A, curibo, plus minus ribavirin. If the patient with child B, what was the regimen at that time? They told us to give sufosbuvir, trufosbuvir every other day, plus daclatasvir, plus minus ribavirin. But sure, uh, this once, inshallah, yani, uh, the, 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 the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, will finish, I think this, this will be changed because already we have it closed. Okay, and do, do you like this to ask? The, 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 okay, do you like to ask Dr. Munir anything about the, Dr. Amai? Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, do, do you have any other points to want to, to uh, share with us, Dr. Munir? I know that time is limited, but uh, because you, you, you raised the issue of, uh, of uh, tacrolimus or drug-drug interaction, uh, I want just to say because already we have patients like this, some patients like this, you know, of course. Okay, one patient might have the problem of uh, toxicity by tacrolimus, but uh, other patients pass. The issue is that we have to school. American stool, going with what you said, don't co-administer Curivo plus Tacrolimus. But there is a European school which also do not recommend the combination, but if you have only this combination available or you, you have to get, you have to, of course, uh, reduce the dose uh, of the chrolimus and very frequent uh, uh, follow-up for the liver. This is what we did, uh, Dr. Munir, when we used the yes. combination. We used yes. the smallest dose of the chrolimus, yes, sure. half milligram every, every couple of days. So yes. if we monitor, if we depend upon a trough level before the chrolimus, so if we did it uh, in the second day or third day or first day, it will be very high. So it's very difficult to accept this combination, uh, especially yeah. after the presence of more friendly drugs to be used. Okay, thank, the problem. Yes. thank you very much. Of course, we have to say that Everolimus, never ever, no American, no European guideline accepted that. Everolimus, more bad than Tacrolimus in the combination. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Munir. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy by the uh, the paper that Professor May uh, referred to you, uh, to, uh, to the Kidney International paper that direct antiviral drugs may slow progression of ki chronic kidney disease. Beco before this paper, we were uh, consumed by the, the experience that we have from case reports or some cases that create increases or kidney function deteriorates after starting direct antiviral drugs. But uh, this uh, manuscript showed clearly that the antiviral drugs uh, are very nice, uh, good weapons to uh, uh, let, uh, let us to live without hepatitis C. I'm sure that Professor Al-Fishawi will discuss uh, many interesting points in his presentation. And it is the time for Professor Hussein Al-Fishawi to, uh, for the last and not least presentation in this meeting, uh, hepatitis C associate glomerulopathy, Professor Al-Fishawi. Faddala Basha. May I have a slide? <laughs> Dr. Hussein. Yes. Yes, please. Are the slides are, are, are now obvious for you? Yes. Okay. اضغط بس على الـ على الـ هو السكرين عشان يبقى يس اي التلفزيون الصغير ده يس اي ام هابي توداي تو بي ويز جاست ماي جريد بليز يا دكتور حسين كليك السلايد شو يس اي مي اي هاف ميد ات نو نوت يت 
اضغط بس على بتاع التلفزيون اللي تحت دوت عشان تلاقيها بسلايد شو احنا شايفين السلايدز بس مش بس صغيره ميد سلايد شو نعم اوكي اوكي دكتور حسين اتفضل Is, is it obvious for you? It's not yet on the slideshow. I made the slideshow now, yes. Is it obvious for you now? Dr. Hussein, is it obvious for you? It is not yet on the slideshow. Dr. Ramay, I mean. الشريحة احنا شا... احنا شايفينها بس انت مش دايس على التلف... على السلايد شو اللي تحت يعني اللي هو التلفزيون دايس على دايس عليه ما هو سلايد شو اه سلايد شو This is the slide show now يعني لو انت عندك مشكلة اتكلم وربنا يسهل بقى هنعمل ايه السلايد شو كده واضحة؟ هي هي احنا ممكن نشوف كده عموما اه ماشي يلا كمل لو تروح حسين اتفضل طب لحظه بس لحظه انا مش عارف فين المشكله بالظبط ممكن النت يبقى عندك بطيئه شويه اعملها نزلها واعملها تاني يا دكتور حسين Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Hussain. Father. Hey, la hasaltain. Dr. Hussain. I think that the person is disconnected. لا, أنا شايف قدام يا محمد. هو ميوت هو ميوت انا دكتور حسين سامعك ما اعرفش المشكله فين عندي اوبن تشير تاني يا دكتور حسين تشير سكرين تاني يس Yes, please. Is it obvious now? It's obvious. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Very clear. Go ahead. Yes. I now I'll speak uh, about a novel management of hepatitis C virus related glomerulopathy. My agenda I will speak today about the impact of hepatitis C virus on survival rate, the impact of hepatitis C virus on extra hepatic diseases, the impact of hepatitis C virus on the kidney. HCV-related women frights, the pathogenesis of hepatitis C virus-related GN, and the evidence of treatment of hepatitis C virus-related GN, the concept of management of hepatitis C virus-related GN, and the management of this hepatitis C virus-related GN. As we know that, as we know that, Egypt represents previously the highest impact over the world, with serological prevalence of about 13.9, about 15%, and positive nucleic acid, about 10%, and our patients, 90% of them are genotype 4, which are difficult to treat. As we know that, there is usually chronic hepatitis C virus is associated with eight to 12 years reduction in overall life expectancy and reduced quality of life. And chronic hepatitis C virus patients have significantly higher mortality rate. And as we can see, chronic hepatitis C virus infection usually have increases mortality reaching up to 30%. And in this situation, also in this situation, there is, of course, increase in mortality, especially in patients with hepatic diseases due to increased incidence of liver cancer. And as we can see there, extra hepatic diseases also have markedly increased 
in patients with chronic hepatitis C virus infection. As we can see, chronic hepatitis C virus infection usually have increased extrahepatic diseases. In this situation, we have usually extrahepatic diseases increased, cardiovascular diseases, and nephrites, which are present in about 2.7. Uh, the, the highest, of course, issue is with nephrites and with the highest ha hazard ratio, 2.77. Samani uh, Samani? Samani muted. Samani, can I Samani? Yes. Samani, 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 معلش لحظة 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 في عندي مشكلة بس حصلت لحظة ماشي يا باشا يلا اوكي لحظه كده الصوره واضحه؟ اي أيوة واضحه اتفضل تمام طيب فطبعا الكرونيك هيباتيت سيفير انفكشن there was increased mortality from extra hepatic diseases and in our situation here nephrites have presented the major impact for this extra hepatic disease with hazard ratio 2.77 as we can see nephrites nephrotic syndrome and the other renal diseases, of course, have higher incidence in hepatitis C virus, seropositives, rather than who are seronegative. And we can find that hepatitis C virus with cryoglomia type 2 or 3 usually have the least overall survival rate. And we can see that patient, of course, with sustained viral response have, of course, less risk of all cause mortality, while patient with no sustained viral response have, of course, higher rate of mortality. Let us discuss in this situation what's going on to understand the role of hepatitis C virus. As you can see, this is the viron. We have a C which is responsible for apoptosis and cytopathogenicity. We have E4 entry and we have the nice structure protein, special 3, which is responsible for the host's innate immunity. As you can see, this is the viron. We have a core and we have envelope. Usually the core enter renal cells, such as mesangial cells, and it induces apoptosis, which causes apoptosis and injury of these cells. Also the envelope, which may enter inside the cell and responsible for oncogenesis. And hence that, there is a fear that once you have a hepatitis C virus, you always may be liable to have malignancy, even if you have treated this virus because oncogenesis have been done. This is usually mainly on mesangial cells through the toll like receptor 3. The nice structure protein will stimulate through toll receptor 2 dendritic cells, which will release interferon gamma that will stimulate the natural killer T lymphocytes, and also interferon gamma will stimulate natural killer cells. Both or all 
the dendritic cells, natural killer T lymphocytes, and natural killer cells can directly attack uh, these, of course, renal cells and can, of course, making a severe injury. And, of course, with natural killer T lymphocytes attacking the cell, usually we have the combination through the complex, and this, of course, activate more the natural killer T lymphocytes to, to more destruction for and injury for the renal cells. But why chronic, what hepatitis C virus is chronic infection? Because hepatitis C virus, in spite of stimulation of the immune system and stimulation of the immune response, usually it has a side way that it can suppress the immune system so that it's a chronic infection. The, the envelope usually stimulate the natural killer cells through the receptor CD81 so that this combination usually will suppress the natural killer T lymphocytes, which will, its suppression will suppress, of course, the dendritic cells. Also, it will affect through the TD94, which also will suppress the natural killer cells. So that this is the part of innate immunity regarding HCV. But don't miss that dendritic cells will stimulate the plasmoid cell and it will produce interferon gamma directly affecting the renal cells. Also, interferon gamma will stimulate the CD4 lymphocytes to be differentiated to B lymphocytes. And B lymphocytes also can be stimulated directly by the envelope through the PC, the PC receptor or CD81. Activation of B lymphocytes also will affect hazardly, of course, the, plasma, the mesangial cells and the renal cells. But B lymphocytes will, st will stimulate and secrete IgG. Also, it will secrete rheumatoid factor, which is IgM. The combination of IgG plus IgM will produce, of course, cryoglobulins, which is responsible for a lot of the deleterious effects in this situation. While differentiation of CD4 and its secretion of interleukin-4, of course, will stimulate T helper 2 cells. And this type of cells may, of course, modulate and regulate the immune system and suppress it. But CD4 also, if it is produced in telucon 1, it will stimulate T helper 1 cells. T helper 1 cells can stimulate the differentiated plasmoid cells to CD8. Also, it will affect it so that its affection, of course, will produce the fast ligand and, and granzyme, which can affect and destroy the renal cells. This is the adaptive immunity. So that it's have innate immunity and of course adaptive or cell mediated immunity. So that it's a complex process. Let us see in our situation, when the dendritic cells act as antigen presenting cell and combined with the viron, it will stimulate the B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes will lead to clonal expansion. This clonal expansion have either one of two directions. If it is, if we have genetic operation and marked oncogenic signaling, it will produce B-cell non-hologic lymphoma on the right side of the gland. But if it is differentiated to plasma cells, these plasma cells will produce the IgM, which will combine with the Ig and the hepatitis C virus to make the cryogenic complex, which will be attached to endothelial cells and, of course, fix the complement and activating the complex attacking membrane with occurrence of severe inflammatory response and, of course, end organ damage. So that the condition started long history when we have the viral the hepatitis C virus, the chronic hepatitis C virus infection will start to stimulate the B cell to produce, of course, IgM. Later on, with progression of the condition and more stimulation, the IgG, hepatitis C virus immune complex, can stimulate B cells either directly or indirectly through T cell dependent mechanism. And with the progression and the stimulation of B lymphocytes, it will produce the IgM. The IgM will stimulate, will of course bind the, remote, uh, the, the IgG plus the virus and forming the immune complex or the cryoglobulin immune complex, which also will stimulate the B cells and the process will be, of course, propagated. And so that this continuous process, of course, may lead the all hazards that can, you can see with the cryogenic vasculites in our body. So that to know what's going in the glomerulus, we know that hepatitis C virus can stimulate the formation of hepatitis C virus Ig, 
when we have only hepatitis C virus IgG position, it will cause what is known as non cryogenic glomerulonephritis. But if hepatitis C virus have stimulated B lymphocytes for the production of rheumatoid factor, this rheumatoid factor either to be deposited in the kidney and to make cyto binding with the IgG or with the hepatitis C virus IgG IgM to form what is known as this immune complex and the cryogenic and produce cryogenic glomerulonephritis. So, so that hepatitis C virus can produce or making vasculites through affecting medium-sized vessels through the process of polyarthritis medosa, or it can, of course, making cryoglobins and affect small vessel and making small vessel vasculites. So that, what about hepatitis C virus and renal disease? HCV may lead to renal disease or be associated with renal disease. It may accelerate progression of CKD to end stage. Clinically silent renal disease may occur Glomerular disease can occur in native kidneys and even in renal allografts. Of course, diabetes, which may be directly related to hepatitis C virus and hypertension, common in hepatitis C virus, this is another comorbid condition. When hepatitis C virus affects the kidney, it may produce renal disease to be associated with renal disease. It may produce membrane preventive GN. These are the commonest affection. Membrane preventive GN or mixed cryogenemia or membrane GN or polyarthritis medusa. Of course, crescentic GN can occur on the top of any of the previous findings. But don't miss that hepatitis C virus also can make other glomerulopathies less common, such as focal segmental GN, preventive GN, mesangial preventive, focal segmental neutralizing GN, IgN nephropathy, post infectious, fibrillary. Glomerulopathies, immunotactoid, glomerulopathies, amyloidosis, interstitial nephrites, TMA, and acute and chronic transplant glomerulopathies. So that we have a lot of way that hepatitis C virus commonly and uncommonly can affect the kidney. What is our evidence that hepatitis C virus is the responsible one that they have in this situation with this urinary affection, they have found that the position of the virus itself inside the renal tissues. And it can cause several processes and several GN. It can produce membrane GN in this situation, such as tram track or double contour appearance. It can produce urinary frites, cryogenic urinary frites, with the, with the deposition, of course, of its high line material with membrane preventive and mesangial preventive. In this situation, with cryogenic urinary frites, as you can see, it can be deposited in the urinaries, forming the cryogenic deposits, which can be also detected by the immune fluorescence. And if it is deposited in the small artery, it will produce vasculites. It can produce membrane nephropathy in this slide, FSGS. Hepatitis C virus also can be associated with IgA nephropathy. It can, in this situation, produce fibrillary GN. In this situation, in the electromicroscopy, we can see the microfibrils, obviously, as you can see in this slide. And it can produce immunotactoid GN with the presence of the microtubules. Of course, with the presence of the hyaline from by, it can produce thrombotic microangiopathy, and in transplant lesion, it can produce either acute or chronic transplant neuropathy. So to understand what we are treating, according to what we are treating, this is, is my opinion, how to be classified hepatitis C virus-related neuropathy. Either cryoglobulins or non-cryoglobulins. Cryoglobulins may be others, such as innate immunity, toll like receptor insulin resistance, or direct viral injury of the cells, or interferon treatment itself, or immune complexes. The immune complexes may produce IgA, hepatitis C virus, or IgG, hepatitis C virus. IgG, hepatitis C virus may be IgG1, or IgG3, or direct endothelial antibodies. When we have a cryoglobulins, what about in the kidney? Cryoglobulins, if present in the native kidney, it may produce mixed cryoglobulin, membrane preventive GN, and the cryovasculites and others. While in transplanted kidney, it can produce early complications, late complications, early TMA, acute transplant neuropathies, late recurrence, de novo, membrane preventive GN, and the cryogenic, of course, vasculites. What about immune complexes? If it is immune complexes, hepatitis C virus, IgG, this IgG affecting the native kidney, producing membrane preventive GN and others, and of course, non Cryogenic vasculites in transplant kidney, it can also produce early complications, late complications from TMA, acute transplant neuropathy, late complications, recurrence, or de novo, or memory of TFGN, or non 
cryogenic glomerular fluids. If it is due to direct viral injury of the cells in the native kidney, it produces FHGS or non cryogenic vasculites or the entity which is known as what wasn't previously explained, but now it's explained tubular interstitial nephrites. But if it has direct injury the cells, it of course can produce transplant kidney early complications with TMA and the acute transplant and late complications such as the current GN focal segmental sclerosis and non cryogenic vasculites. What about interferon treatment? Interferon treatment in the native kidney, it can produce minimally change disease or transplant kidney, it can produce acute graft rejection or acute gene frights or cryogenic vasculites or non cryogenic vasculites and others. What about if we have IgA? IgA in the native kidney can produce IgA nephropathy, while in transplant kidney, it can produce recurrence of IgA nephropathy and de novo IgA nephropathy. Is there is a relation between IgA nephropathy and the hepatitis C virus? Yes, both are common in, uh, infection, uh, are common in, uh, association. The, the affection of the liver can produce IgA nephropathy. Also, IgA can directly Hepatitis virus, I'm sorry, can directly stimulate IgA nephropathy. So that, what else can occur? If, if we have hepatitis C virus IgG, it may produce direct endothelial antibody. This direct endothelial antibody can produce in the native kidney what is known as non cryogenic vasculites and direct endothelial antibodies for transplant kidney. Here the treatment is through thrombotic microangiopathy and the acute transplant and late complications non cryogenic vasculites. And here, of course, if it is this process due to direct antibody versus cryo and others, every one of these entities have a different uh, management line. So let us see hepatitis C infection in renal patients. It can produce mild GN with active renal sediment without renal insufficiency or nephrotic syndrome. It may be moderate to severe, active renal sediment with renal insufficiency and between up to nephrotic syndrome, it can produce, of course, the nephrotic syndrome. When we have a patient coming with renal affection, hepatitis C virus, urine analysis, proteinuria should be detected, liver function tests, kidney function tests, complement three and four, rheumatoid factor, cryoglobulins, PCR, hepatitis C virus, ultrasound must be done. Of course, renal biopsy here is very important to determine my line of management. What are indications for treatment? If we have moderate to severe disease, such as nephrotic syndrome, elevated plasma creatinine, new hypertension, or signs of cryogenemia, or if having in my biopsy, fibrosis or tubular disease, I should start my management. Or progressive disease, which means that I have disease, but it is gradually progressive, so that I should treat to avoid reaching end stage kidney disease, or if I have acute severe disease, such as in cases of renal failure with rapid progressive GN, such as mixed cryogenemia. Symptomatic treatment should be done as other cases of GN, blood pressure control, diuretics, and of course, ACE and ARBs should be used, treatment of hyperlipidemia when present. What about antiviral treatment? Antiviral treatment should be started in patients with moderate proteinuria and not, and not non-rapid progressive renal failure. In this situation, we can be on, on, only confined to antiviral therapy. But if the patient is more progressed, with nephritic syndrome or nephrotic range of pneumonia or progressive renal failure, in these aggressive situations and severe situations, we should, of course, use immunosuppressive therapy plus antiviral therapy. So that patients with moderate proteinuria and non-rapid but progressive renal failure can be treated only with antiviral therapy. And we have found that in several studies, one of these studies was done by Dr. Ala Sabri of Kourm Mansoura 2002, that only antiviral therapy have decreased significantly and renal function remain stable. Nowadays, with the appearance of DAs therapy, of course, they have been used for, of course, management in cases of cryogenic mesenteric GN and other types of hepatitis C virus rated GN, of, of course, to control the kidney affection. Other evidence. Hepatitis C virus associated with mixed cryonemia, treated with direct acting antiviral agents. In these situations, when we have seen we have excellent viral response, proteinuria decreases, and of course, kidney functions improved with the improvement of estimated GFR. 
Another evidence that immunosuppressive and antiviral treatment of hepatitis C virus associated with their disease, a long-term follow-up, they have found that in this situation, either treatment with DAs or interferon previously was accompanied by reduction with proteinuria and the increase, of course, in the and reduction toward the increase of serum proteinuria with stabilization of the kidney functions. This is another important article and meta-analysis showed that association of renal function and direct acting antiviral agents it was very important to slow the progression of the chronic kidney disease. Another study and evidence showed that direct acting antiviral therapy slows kidney function, decline in patients with hepatitis C virus infection and the chronic kidney disease. This is another evidence showed that anti-hepatitis C virus therapy in chronic kidney disease patients improves long-term renal and patient survival. So that very, very important for proper management, either with antiviral therapy or, or drugs, plus immunosuppressive therapy will stabilize the kidney functions, will stabilize the keratinine, may improve the GFR, will leading to reduction of proteinuria and prevent the progression of my GN or my this chronic kidney disease towards end stage kidney disease. In the setting of cryonemia, we have more immune aggressive with more immunosuppressive therapy. Steroids as a general, of course, anti-inflammatory way Plasma exchange for removal of circulating cryoglobulins, cyclophosphamide to suppress B cells, and toximab to deplete B cells, and of course, antiviral therapy, of course, for control of proteinuria and for stabilization of kidney functions. These are the concepts in this situation. So that the best management, of course, if you have aggressive disease such as cryoglobulin vasculitis, is rituximab or anti-CD20, with its use, they have found that there is reduction of the cryoglobulins and there is improvement of proteinuria and destabilization of the kidney functions. And this is another study showed that etoximab, when used alone for HCV, they have found that reduction of proteinuria significantly and destabilization of creatine and its improvement. And so that when it was compared with others, etoximab regarding immunosuppressive therapy is the drug of choice or superior in severe cases for HCV cryogenic vasculitis. This is another evidence that immunosuppressive and the antiviral treatment of the C virus both associated with GN, a long-term follow-up. They have found that with sustained viral response, the reduction of proteinuria and there is reduction of in the increase of serum creatine. So that, what is our target in therapy in this cryogenic vasculitis? Number one, for eradication of the viral HCV previously by, of course, interferon and nowadays by DAs, drugs. B cell expansion to be suppressed either by depletion of these B cells by monoclonal antibodies, such as rituximab, per generation, of course, or suppression of these cells by accelerating agents such as cyclophosphamide or the use of second or third generation monoclonal antibodies, which may deplete B lymphocytes. But don't miss that you should giving corti corticosteroids as anti-inflammatory agents and of course, recombinant interleukin-2, which is aldosteroidine, of course, for regulation of T lymphocytes activity. So that previously, this was the issue or therapeutic algorithm for management of cryogenic vasculitis. Clinically asymptomatic, wait and watch with or without antiviral therapy. If you have moderate disease, cryovasculitis without organ damage, antiviral therapy with or without corticosteroids. If you have severe disease, either cryovasculitis with organ damage, please use antiviral therapy, plus B cell depleting monoclonal antibody and glucocorticoids. And in cases of rapidly progressive or life-threatening condition, life-threatening conditions such as cryovasculitis with non hodgkin lymphoma, antiviral, rituximab, plus or minus chemotherapy. While if you have rapid progressive renal failure and others, plasmapharesis, steroid, pulse of steroids, B cell depleting monoclonal antibodies with or without cyclophosphamide, followed by antiviral therapy previously, but now in the, in the era of interferon, but now, of course, because this paper was in the era of interferon, but nowadays this concept has been changed. How we can treat hepatitis C virus-related GN? Of course, we was very concerned about that, and in Qasr Aini, with my dear professors in this meeting, Professor Dr. Gamal Saad and Professor Dr. Maya Hasaballah, with our, my great teacher, Dr. Rashad Barsoum, and other professors, we have made this paper for the importance of management of HCV in patients with extrahepatic manifestations. Previously, 
including guidelines for treatment of hepatitis C infection, we should be for treatment of visitors weight benefit risk ratio. And they had mentioned that it is suggested that antiviral therapy be considered for patients with hepatitis C virus rated GN. But in the newest guidelines, the ACD guidelines, all patients with hepatitis C virus infection, not to be elevated, but should be treated, should be treated. And the KDGO guidelines 2018 for the management of hepatitis C virus and its treatment, they have mentioned a very important point that they recommend HCV patients for antiviral therapy. They recommend use interferon free regimen because of the hazards of interferon, especially renal patients. They recommend to treat even patients with GFR more than 30 with other drugs as general practice. And in GFR or advanced CKD below 30 meters per minute should be treated with ribavirin free, of course, interferon free DA based regimen. So that, what about patients with glomerular fibrosis? What are the recommendations? We recommend the renal biopsy in order to know what we are treating. This is very important. We recommend that hepatitis C virus associated GN to be treated for hepatitis C virus with grade 1A. Of course, we should treat hepatitis C virus, which is the initiating factor. They recommend that patients with hepatitis C virus disease showing a stable kidney function and or non-nephrotic urea which means that milder form treated with DA. And they recommend if they, we have cryogenic flare, nephrotic syndrome, or rapid progressive kidney failure to be treated with immunosuppressive agents with or without plasma change. Of course, in this situation, immunosuppressive therapy, even in patients not with the flare, but with histologically active HCV associated GN who do not respond to antiviral therapy, don't leave them because the inflammatory process and the urgent process will progress towards end stage kidney disease. And of course, the first line for immunosuppressive therapy, especially in cryogenic vasculites, is rituximab. So that, let us see how we can deal with that. Let us dance with the wolf, which is in our situation is hepatitis C virus. This is the rationale we have mentioned that in this situation, that antiviral therapy for killing or eradication of the viral anti-CD20 for depletion of B-lymphocytes and other immunosuppressive uh, regimens such as steroids for, of course, general anti-inflammatory indications and for suppression of T-lymphocytes, cyclophosphamide, of course, for suppression of B-lymphocytes and plasma pharesis for removal of these immune complexes which are depositing the tissue with complement fixation and activation of the immune system and, of course, end organ damage. So that how we can manage in our situations. In cases of non-cryoglobulins and the cryoglobulins. In case of cryoglobulins, of course, we'll give direct antiviral, antiviral therapy from the start. Previously, we were postponing the, DA, the, the treatment of the virus 12 weeks or more after giving the heavy immunosuppressive therapy. But now, don't waste your time early from the start. Give the direct antiviral therapy, plus steroid pulses, plasma exchange, rituximab, and cyclophosphamide. And if we are thinking that the incriminated is viral, direct injury of the cells, such as FAGS, here there is no need for immunosuppressive therapy. Just the is, it is very important histopathologically and in the pathogenic means what we are treating. Not every case coming with GN will get immunosuppressive therapy. So that in cases of, if it is the non cryoglobin is due to viral diagnosis, just DAs. If it is due to interferon treatment, number one, stop interferon, mostly the case will respond. If there is no response, of course, in this situation, you should treat the virus if it is still active. Steroids here, drug of choice, other user therapy must be, you should wait for it until failure of steroids alone. In cases of immune complexes, if it is, of course, hepatitis C virus, Related IgG, of course, here the situation is, of course, direct acting antiviral agents, of course, steroids with a small dose, other immunosuppressive therapy in a special situations. If we have IgA, yes, the same, it is, of course, antiviral therapy, steroids, small dose, and here the uh, other type may be the drug of choice. And in the situations of direct endothelial antibody, here we should give, here will be the drug of choice, is 
direct antiviral therapy, steroids, here not plasma hyalysis really, but here cyclophosphamide will be the drug of choice. So that how we can manage hepatitis C virus related neuropathy, clinical asylum nerve disease, just antiviral therapy according to liver rules. If we have mild disease in the form of mild to moderate non-nephrotic with normal kidney functions, still use antiviral therapy. But if we have moderate to severe disease with nephrotic syndrome, reduced kidney functions, signs of cryogenesis in this situation, antiviral therapy followed by short-term course of low-dose corticosteroids. And if still resistance, rituximab will be the drug of a choice. Why? In case of catastrophic conditions with rapid progressive GN, or of course, morning rights multiplex, or CNS manifestations, or pulmonary affection, in this situation, antiviral therapy from the start, not to be postponed with pulse steroids, plasma exchange, rituximab, and cyclophosphamide. Sometimes, in severe cases, if you have tried antiviral therapy with a small dose of steroid, and still you are giving it and rituximab, you are giving without adequate response or progression of the condition, you should jump immediately towards the full blown dose of pulse steroids, plasma exchange, and plus or minus cyclophosphamide. So that take home message, classification of hepatitis C virus is based upon being cryoglobulins or non-cryoglobulins. The non-cryoglobulins may be due to others innate to light receptors, insulin resistance, or viral direct energy of the cells, or interferon treatment, or immune complexes. Immune complexes may be IgA or IgG. Well, IgG may be IgG1, IgG3, or direct endothelial antibody with a lot of details as we have prescribed previously. For its management, clinically silent urinary disease, please just antiviral therapy. Mild to moderate non-nephrotic range of pneumonia with normal kidney functions. In this situation, also antiviral therapy. If you have more severe disease with nephrotic syndrome or starting reduction of the kidney functions or starting signs of cryogenemia, in this situation, antiviral followed by a short-term course of low steroids for six months. Maybe I give steroids 20 milligrams and rituximab in distant situations, but don't miss that the aggressive forms or catastrophic forms or rapid progressive GN, not also the kidney, affecting the kidney, CNS, digestive, monorats, multiplex, and of course, pulmonary infarctions. These situations should be treated properly with pulse steroids, of course, at the start, antiviral by DAs, plus pulse steroids, plasma exchange, rituximab, plus or minus cyclophosphamide, and thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hussain. It is really very interesting, very clear. Uh, algorithms are very nice. And um, uh, <clears throat> it seems that Professor Gamal Saadi wants to uh, give his comments. Professor Gamal, uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Hussain, for this very uh, excellent uh, and very comprehensive uh, presentation, very Thank updated. You. Uh, uh, could you elaborate, please, on the role of the uh, uh, host targeting agents and their value in the management, particularly in the severe forms where you can add several drugs, including statins, cyclophilins, uh, and uh, aldosterone antagonists, which might modify the response uh, to the treatment protocol? Yes, thank you, sir, for this important question. When I'm treating here, hepatitis C virus rated GN, I have two issues to be treating. The first issue, the hepatitis C virus itself, the inciting factor, and the urinary affection or the kidney affection or the GN, which should be treated in this situation. So that in this, in this situation, general rules must be adapted here. The first rule that, of course, a tight control of blood pressure. It is very important. The second issue, in this situation, we should, of course, treat these uh, situations with ACE or ARBs inhibitor, according to my general rules for management in GN. It is very, very important to use other medications such as statin. But please be careful when you are using statin. It is not advised if we have from the start three false elevation of liver enzymes or more. I think in this situation, it is much better to, uh, of course, postpone statins. But if you have normal liver enzymes and normal uh, liver, you can start from the statin with 
monitoring of the liver enzymes. If it had exceeded the three, if it is with mild rise, you can continue. But if in this situation, if it exceeded three folds, of course, in this situation, you we can continue statin. Plus, the immunosuppressive suppressive therapy modulation, it doesn't here follow the rules, such as if we have membranes, minimally change, if we have IgA nephropathy. Uh, we, we, in this situation, we are not following the normal rules for other primary GN. Here we have special situations and a lot of, of course, combinations, but for the time factor, each one of the GN can make, we have, can make lecture on this GN because it has a, a very special type according to hematuria, according to proteinuria, according to histopathological structure, according to tuber interstitium, degree of fibrosis, according to hypertension, according to response of initial management, according, 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 and according for the progression of the kidney functions, is it stabilized or it's progressing? All these factors must be considered while I'm treating this uh, entity. Sometimes Dr. Hussein cryoglobulinemia is manifested by severe hypertension. So to, to put in mind the severe hypertension, which is not responsive to the traditional management of hypertension, to put in mind the issue of cryo related vasculitis, and it may need a specific treatment for cryoglobulinemia. I want to ask you, Professor Hussein, about the reports that was published from uh, Cairo University, uh, cryoglobulinemic glomerulonephritis after clearance of hepatitis C virus by direct antiviral drug. Yes, uh, I am very thankful for you, Dr. Hussein, for this uh, issue. Of course, we have an important paper which was published by Al-Qasr uh, really, several uh, publications. We have publications related to the nephrology in our unit that the presence of GN after eradication of the virus. And we have a very important paper by Professor Dr. Gafar Ragab in rheumatology that also the same that he have cryogenic systemic vasculites after eradication of the virus. What is the explanation, is, Hussein? The explanation we have really several explanations. And hence that, in one meeting, me and you, uh, Dr. Hussein, when uh, Dr. Jadili was present, he was very interested, he, he was very intuitive for management for donors for hepatitis C virus to treat fir first and then to transplant or giving them as donors. And I was objecting hardly for that. And also you are objecting for that. Why? Because here it is not a simple infection. This infection usually play in the immune system by several ways, by the innate system and through the memory cells. This was a very important meeting in France in about June 1918. It was a very, very important meeting and, and it's hot topic. By this was the, the, the topic. If by eradication of the virus, you have get eradication of the virus and its sequelae, the answer here wasn't known because they have found, found that uh, even after eradication of the virus, Malignancy may occur because the virus acts on the oncogenes inside the cells, the virus acts on the immune system, the virus leaves its print, so that even if you have released the virus, you have the memorial cells. In this situation, any cross infection or any similar infection or for unexplained issues, stimulation of these cells again, it will stimulate the immune system. Here, the B lymphocytes will be stimulated again you have a memorial cells for IG, you have a memorial cells for IgM. Here, as we know that the immune, the immune complex, IgG, IgM, without the presence of the virus itself, it can be deposited in the kidney and in other tissues, such as in the nerves, in the CNS, so others the, and others. So this and means, Dr. Hussein, Dr. Hussein yes. so this means that we should continue following up our patients, even yes, after right. eradication of the virus. And I have a question to Professor and, and, and I'm sorry, Dr. Hussein, if, if they have presented an immune response, yes. I will treat it immunologically. Yes, of course, we, I mean, I we treat, treat the disease, itself. the common disease, yes. without antiviral yes. drug. And we yes. treat and, my immune suppressive drug according yes. to the, the presentation. Dr. Munir, and even Dr. Hussein, I, I'm sorry for interruption. Oh, yeah. They have found that some situations, you are giving rituximab for four doses. Day number one, 7, 14, 21, not only that, you are still giving every six months a booster dose of rituximab for a very long duration. Some cases, 
reached up to five years with regular giving rituximab every six months so that to remain the immune system under total but I, but I cannot take this uh, recommendation at all. I cannot. No, uh, I'm not taking this recommendation. I'm taking that. Yani, we have we have a severe immunological disease up to that you, yes. you may be in need for continuous immunosuppressive therapies in some uh, situations. Okay. Uh, Professor Munir Bahgat, is, uh, uh, you, uh, do you agree about the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma potential after treating hepatitis C by diet antiviral drug? Is it still hepatoma a, a problem and noise in the treatment? Dr. Munir? It seems that uh, there is a problem with him. Dr. Hussein. Uh, uh, what's uh, uh, hepatoma and uh, after hepat after diet antiviral drug is it still a headache yes. or uh, it was um, uh, some rebels and disappeared completely nowadays? Yes, I, I'm very thankful for this for this very very important question because at a certain period a lot of people and a lot of reports uh, have attacked and diet antiviral therapy as being oncogenic drugs and they can may, may stimulate the occurrence of cancer. Of course, most of the recent studies have abolished and aborted this theory, and they, they have found that not the drug that in turn may produce the hepatocellular carcinoma or malignancy, but this is due to the previous viral effect. Even if you have eradicated the virus, this virus may act on the of pro-oncogenes such as P53, P27, and P164, and others. They have found that the playing on these oncogenes have occurred so that the process of occurrence of malignancy, it is not due to the antiviral therapy. The occurrence is due to the previous effect of hepatitis C but virus. But the previous effect of a hepatitis C virus was not uh, evidenced with interferon era. Because interferon has, um, I think, had another pathway in dealing with immunity. Uh, yes, because interferon make usually it is it is a drug that can induce apoptosis. Okay. So that even if you have a proncogenes, interferon was inducing apoptosis through its ligand over the cells. Why the direct antiviral therapy doesn't introduce apoptosis? It's okay. only produce eradication of the virus without induction of apoptosis for the abnormal cells. This here we have another question, Dr. Hussein. Uh, what about lung fibrosis as side effect of long-standing use of rituximab? I don't know, yes. uh, I don't know this complication of rituximab. Do you have idea about uh, the data about lung fibrosis? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yes, please. Uh, for long-term uh, occurrence of rituximab, this was a, a debatable really, but until now, there's no hard proven that rituximab is responsible for this fibrosis. Most probably, as you know, that rituximab is used for management of autoimmune diseases. And some of these immune diseases may be silent immune diseases that, as you know, that immune disease may have a florid part and silent part, that, which means that the immune system may attack some organs silently and produce a very tedious process, such as rheumatoid arthritis, such as SLE, it can produce the boom and, and the other types of lung affection. They have found that on the longer term, they can produce autoimmune lung disease or lung fibrosis. So that the thought now, it is not due to the toximab. It is thought that you are dealing with the toximab for long, for long, uh, for, for autoimmune diseases with long acting hazards. So that most likely this is not the effect of toximab. Most probably it is the effect of the disease itself, not as you uh, know that, I think when we have autoimmune is, disease... Uh, Dr. Hussain, I think it is a logic uh, explanation. Now we will take uh, a comment from Professor Adam. Dr. Ahmed. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if uh, Dr. Dr. Adam... ...got two parts, one specifically for the hepatology and the other for the rest of the panel. Okay. The, uh, if we, we agree that the liver biopsy is obsolete, not like the kidney biopsy, which is a mandatory for treatment. Do we have a magic result in the fibro scan which prohibit us from using direct acting agent or not? And the second related question, 
uh, should we allow to use direct acting agent for treating kidney disease irrespective of the liver status? And if the answer is yes, does this has any implication on the liver status? Yes. Can I answer this question, Dr. Hussein? Uh, excuse me, Hussein. If Dr. Munir with us. And answer this question? Munir. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Munir. It seemed that we lost uh, Dr. Munir. Can I answer this question, Dr. Hussein? Yes, yes. Go ahead, Dr. Yes. Hussein. I, I will start for asking for the first issue. Yes. When we are assessing now the liver functions, you are depending upon fibroscan for assessing the degree of fibrosis. And of course, we have, you have several equations that can, can assess the degree of fibrosis. So that now the, you have in actual in, uh, in hepatology, if you allow me, actual. Dr. Hussein, if you allow me, uh, according to Kiduki, yes, uh, review uh, yes. and the commentary on Kiduki guidelines that was released in the American Journal of Kidney Disease since a few days ago. The uh, since a few days, the uh, uh, liver biopsy is not needed in the majority of cases. Yes, and yes, I agree. Can depend upon uh, uh, ultrasound elastography and yes. fibro scan to tell us about the state of liver. If and other equations, if, if the elastogram and the fibro scan is not conclusive, still there is a room for liver biopsy to tell us about the uh, degree of fibrosis and extent of hepatic of liver affection. And to put, in mind, is very, is, and to, put mind, to put in mind when we treat the patient, the status of uh, uh, portal hypertension as well, Dr. Hussein. Yes, uh, but. The, 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 the indications here is very, very limited, I think, to It's yes. very limited. Okay. And I think it, for the second question, of course, when I'm treating... He didn't answer the first question, because if you are relying on the fibro scan, yes. what is the conclusive not to treat for the liver? Do we have yes. a... Be, uh, just, to, just to make myself clear, if I did a kidney biopsy and I find yes. interstitial fibrosis, I uh, yes. will not jeopardize the patient to immunosuppression from yes. the kidney point of view. So what about the liver not using direct acting agent? What do you have a magic number, a yes, magic I, figure? Yes, when you have a liver affection, here the rule is to treat the virus itself. And according to FibroScan, according to FeeBB4 equation, according to the Ch Buffett Child scoring system, you can classify your patient if you have fibrosis or not fibrosis, compensated child A or decompensated child B or C. And according to this in hepatology, they have made algorithm for the drug of a choice as an antiviral therapy for hepatitis C virus. Of course, if you have patient without cirrhosis or compensated cirrhosis and his child classification is A, you can use most of the drug that my dear professor, Dr. Maha Sabala have prescribed a general rule. But in situations, if you have a child B or a child C, and still you have viral infection in this situation, you are now allowed to use other drugs. And here, the drug of choice in this situation is the Harmony. VD is the drug of choice. And in the second situation, or the alternative for it, is the is the drug of choice. So I think that we can use the, the choices of drug therapy for management. And this management, even now, they are not relying upon liver biopsy, they are, they, they, they are relying up upon two issues. The fibro scan for determination of the degree of fibrosis, F1 or 2 or 3 or 4, and determining about the degree of this functional fibrosis, because you may have mild fibrosis and the liver is compensated. Either if the liver is decompensated by still child booth classification, and they have other, other classifications now present, you can judge if this liver is compensated, cirrhotic or not cirrhotic, compensated or not compensated, child A or B or C, and according, you can, according to this situation, you can choose your drug of choice from antiviral therapy so that you can eradicate the hepatitis C virus without jeopardizing the uh, liver functions. This is the answer. Nothing will tell you not to treat. Okay. For the for the okay. liver, you treat in all situations, even but, in uh, 
the, the worst situation is. Yes. But the drug, the, the, the drug so of choice. So I got uh, my, uh, my answer from Dr. May that you are going to treat whatever the liver status is, even if it is compensated. Am yes. I correct? Even if liver encephalopathy, if late stage, I will treat. Am I, am I clear? Can I answer this question, please? Can I answer this question? You, uh, you, sir, you didn't give me the answer. Maybe my for mistake. Okay, I can, just need when can I ask the last question, Doctor uh, Doctor Adam. Yes. You have a patient with hepatic encephalopathy. You have two aspects: to treat the acute stage for the hepatic trichoma or encephalopathy, not in this situation, just a few days to bypass this hepatic encephalopathy. And this patient is indicated for liver transplantation so that you will give the antiviral therapy as a bridge until you are doing liver transplantation. And if you have no time to give antiviral therapy, you will go for liver transplantation and you'll treat the virus after liver transplantation. This is their protocol. I think the most important point that was clarified by Professor May uh, we will treat all, all patients, but I'm not sure if we will treat the hepatic encephalopathy by antiviral. But, uh, not for, in the acute situation, yeah, 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 yeah. after but, stabilization. But uh, the, the difference is the choice of the agent. So according yes. to the liver state, the choice of agent will differ. Um, yes. I think we are too late. And I'd like to. Case presentation is not No, خلاص enough. I'm going to do it. 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 I'm to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm who enriched this session so much. So uh, the mic is with you, Professor May, to conclude and to close the session. Well, of course, I'd like to thank you all and thank all the speakers. Uh, it was very fruitful and very informative. And maybe uh, the one thing I want to highlight, what you mentioned, uh, Professor Hussein, is that yes, for CKD patients, we were afraid of using the drugs, the directly acting antiviral in late stages. But now what we have proved that, especially in this group of patients with the GFR less than 30 or less than 60 mils per minute, they show deter we, we don't have deterioration, we have less deterioration of kidney function. So this is one of the drugs that will save the kidney. So it has to be given to all CKD patients, irrespective of their GFR. And of course, the choice of which drug to use depends on many factors, as we mentioned. Okay. So th this is what uh, you really sp spotted out. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Tari, I want uh, to add a comment. Dr. Tari. Tari, Dr. Tari. So, so unmute. Muted. Yes, Dr. Tarek. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Hussein, we're going to listen to the situation because the application of the words is very important. And the situation is very important. Well, I'm going to listen to the situation. 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 No, 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 I'm with you. I'm going to listen to the situation. We're going to listen to the situation. There's a lot of late diagnosis and late management. هيبقى م... هيبقى الفيصل الدكتور احمد ادم لو قال لي نكمل حلقه لا انا موافق طبعا خلاص اتفضل <تصفيق> اتفضل يا دكتور حسين اتفضل طيب اوكي ثانك يو ثانك يو دكتور طارق ثانك يو ادم وان مينت بليز والله يعني يوم فريتفول جدا يعني اللي عنده نفس طويل بقى 50 واحد كويس قوي فيري جود از is it now uh, offered? Yes. No, no, not this. Okay, it is obvious now? Yes. Yes. Yes, of course. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thirty years old female patient. She developed at 2006, presented with low grade fever and severe malaise. Her investigations were within normal, apart that she had elevated liver enzymes, AST-250 and DLT-250. 
73 international units. Otherwise, our investigations are within normal. Please help me in, in the questions because I will ask and please you can answer with me, share with, please with me. This lady should be tested for hepatitis C virus infection. Do you agree? Yes. Or not? Yes. Yes. This is the right answer. Yes, it is the right answer. Mm. What are the FDA approved anti-hepatitis C virus screening assay? Enzyme immunoassay, chemiluminescent immunoassay, microparticle enzyme immunoassay, chemiluminescent microparticle all of the above, none of the above. What's your opinion? Okay, I will answer this question. All of the above is the right answer in this situation because here in the ESL testing and linkage to care table, if they approved commercially available anti hepatitis screening, all what I've mentioned is agreed in this situation. So that all of the above is the right answer. So the right answer is yes. If enzyme immune assay has been done and was positive, hepatitis C virus RNA test should be done. Yes or no? Yes. 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 This is the right answer is yes. Because as you can see here, this is the ACLD. They have recommended any patient with positive anti hepatitis C virus antibody should go for hepatitis C virus RNA, which is the PCR for hepatitis C virus RNA. I would I would like to ask you a question here, Dr. Hussein. What about the false positive results? Is it still uh, valid? False positive. If I have false positive result, I would yeah. use the PCR. Yeah, I know. The percentage yes. of false positive is still there. Yes, yes, it's still. Like in the past. Still usually, still usually there is a percentage of false positive. Yes. Uh, and yes. if you have negative PCR, this means that there is no HCV, or we should repeat PCR at least two times. If if I will answer the questions. If, if I have hepatitis virus positive antibody and if I have negative PCR, I will make this PCR. The recommendation is that you will follow up the liver enzymes and you can repeat it for three times apart from that every three months. If all the results are negative, so that you, you, you mostly have no hepatitis C virus, either false positive or something previous infection and it passed. Okay? Okay. In this situation, PCR hepatitis virus has been done and revealed that viral load 846 thousands. Sonar has been done, showed mild hepatomegaly, no serotic changes, no ascites. This lady should be treated for hepatitis C virus. Yes or no? Definitely yes. Yes, yes I agree totally. This is the rule that I have mentioned Dr. Mai. We should treat all cases. Here, the patient previously, it was 2006, was treated with big interferon and ribavirin. The patient was improved clinically and laboratory. PCR hepatitis C virus became below detected level. Good result. One year later, after management, and the PCR at that time was negative, she developed puffness of both eyelids and bilateral lower lymphedema. Investigations have been done and revealed these investigations are within really normal apart from hyperemia with serum album 3.1. And in your analysis showed no, of course, active sediment, no RBCs, and albumin plus 3. 24 hours urinary proteins showed nephrotic range of proteinuria with proteinuria 4.6 gram per day. And complement C3 and C4 are within really normal with cryoglobulins are negative. And in this situation, PCR, was below detected level, it was negative. In this situation, renal biopsy has been done. What is your expected diagnosis? We have a, a, a case that became, that has a PCR, PCR and PCR was treated, okay? And then, sorry, PCR was treated and PCR became negative. What is your expected diagnosis? Can you choose? Is it in this situation, membrane preventive, mesangia preventive, Membranous, minimally change, post infectious, fibrillary, immunotactoid, amyloid, non cryo, all of the above, none of the above. What's your expectation? Of course, all possibilities are available, but what about your expectation in this situation? Was there any clinical uh, manifestation from the nephrology? <laughs> only, only buffness, nephrotic syndrome, buffness, low lymphedema, and yeah. nephrotic, yes. What's your, what's your here expectation? So we have cocktail of uh, membrane proliferative. Uh, yes. So long as creatine is normal, we, we may think of membrane proliferative or mesangia proliferative, whatever the 
uh, FSGS maybe also as well. Yes. Can get all of the here, yes. he, here the, the most probable diagnosis really is minimally changed disease because the cases which was treated by interferon and relapsed after that with nephrotic range hyponuria with no active urinary sediment, with no uh, hematuria, with no uh, RBC in urine, with no active cast, with normal complement, with uh, normal uh, negative cryo. Most probably, if you, if you made every part of this, it will not be classical in this situation. But in this situation, the most possible diagnosis is to be minimal exchange disease and renal biopsy. Our situation has proved, have proven that. Yes, but what you uh, have said is uh, maybe membranous. Or maybe. Membranous can present by all these. Yes, but here, here the key of this situation, when they have found that post, post treatment with interferon, the commonest is minimal exchange disease. After if one year, you say? After, after one, one year. year for how? Yes, after one year. This is, this, is, this is the golden period for occurrence of minimal exchange after uh, treatment of interferon. Membrane preventive, usually, it is nephritic syndrome mainly. Usually, you may have complement consumption. Maybe you have cryo. Maybe you have hematuria. Mesangia preventive, in this situation, usually you have some hematuria. Membrane GN may be the main deficient diagnosis, but classically, when they have found that most of cases recurred after one year after treatment of interferon, the commonest is minimally exchange disease. Of course, I'm telling you, all, all are possible. All are possible. But I okay. think that what is the most okay, do, okay, Dr. Hussain, expected for, diagnosis. Uh, of course, uh, fibrillary. Just a second, a second, Dr. Hussain, because I noticed here, Professor Hanna Hafiz is with us. Yes. And I'd like to hear from him, even uh, uh, welcoming to you. Dr. Hani. Dr. Hani. Okay, go ahead, Hussain. Of course, if I have fibrillary neuropathy, it is not nephrotic range, immunotactoid non nephrotic range, um, amyloidosis. I, uh, of course, I have more profound proteinuria, non -cribibus. or no yes or no yes 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 i agree of course if we are if we are on treatment of interferon at this duration i should stop interferon and continue management but because in this situation pcr is negative of course i should treat minimally change disease only the most appropriate treatment for this lady what do you think steroids steroids and cyclosporin steroids and cyclosomide Steroids and MMF, all of the above, none of the above. What's your opinion? Steroids. Steroids. Yes, this is totally right. Steroids. Of course, in other situations, you may give steroids plus cyclophosphamide if, 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 if I have minimally changed disease in the classic form. But in this situation, they have Dr. found that. Dr. Hussain, Dr. Yes. Dr. Gamal Saadi mentioned steroid and cyclosporin on the assumption yes. of anti HCV effect of cyclosporin. I, 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 I think so. But uh, minimal change in case of start with steroid, uh, yes. Yes, in, in case of this situation, usually we are starting steroids because it is, it is, they have found that most of the cases are excellently responsive for steroids without recurrence. Okay. So that in this situation, uh, the drug of choice is steroids. In cases of, if we have steroid resistant situations, I, of course, I agree with my dear professor, Dr. Gamal, that we will proceed for steroids and cyclosports. So that this is interferon treatment. The rule is to stop interferon. It is already stopped. To give antiviral therapy, it was treated. To give it steroids, and if it is not respond to steroids, we can proceed for cyclosporin, as my dear Professor Dupemel have told us. She received 60 milligram steroid for two months with complete remission, and the steroids were tapered gradually over four months. The patient became in complete remission. One year later, 
Depression developed severe fatigue, nausea, anorexia, myalgia. Laboratory imaging are within normal apart from elevated liver enzymes, about two folds, AST and ALT. And in this situation, we have found that PCR for hepatitis C virus became positive again. And this explains, of course, the fatigue and nausea. Of course, this is hepatitis C virus manifestations. This lady should be treated. This was at 2008, so or 2009. Please again, this lady should be treated for hepatitis C virus infection, yes or no? Yes. What's your opinion? What's your opinion? Dr. Yes. Saad here, uh, right on the chat, post-treatment immune reconstitution. And there, there was a comment from one of the attendees about anemia, because there was severe anemia, hemoglobin 9. No, not severe, it's not anemia. It is uh, hemoglobin 9.6. Yeah, uh, I yes, don't yeah, know yeah. the, yeah. Yes, it's not that severe. It's, uh, yeah. And moderate enemy. According this to lady should be treated. Huh? Yes. This lady should be treated for a hepatitis virus infection, yes or no? Yes. yes. No. The right answer here is no. Why? In this era, you have interferon only for management. And they have mentioned that if you have given interferon and GN occurred, even if minimally change disease, please avoid the use of interferon for treatment, for retreatment of hepatitis C virus. Apart if that you have a very critical situation or the patient is hardly in need for to be treated. But the classic. Mention, yes, uh, according to a direct acting agent, not interfering. I will not. No, no I'm speaking now 2009. 2000, oh, of sorry, course, you are right. I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about nowadays. Nowadays, of course, you will, you, you will treat now, but I'm speaking yes. previously. The, the answer is no, not to treat this situation. Are you justified to start big interferon and reviving? Yes or no? Of course, no. We're not going to proceed. One year later, the patient developed hematuria, a new event. It was nephrologically, she, she was stable. She developed hematuria. Investigations revealed that albumin 2.9, slight albuminia, with urine analysis, RBC is more than 100, and pus cells 10 to 15. Album 1 plus, 24 hours, your proteins, 1.6, subnephrotic range of urea, with complement, normal, not consumed, and the cryoglobulin are negative, and here PCR hepatitis C virus was 845,000. Through positive findings, the patient developed hematuria with subnephrotic range of proteinuria, and RBCs in urine, of course, because of hematuria, and past cells 10 to 15, normal complement, cryo is negative, PCR is this about 800,000. Renal biopsy has been done. What is your expected diagnosis? Membrane preventive GN, mesangia preventive GN, membrane GN, minimally change disease, post infectious, fibrillary GN, immunotactoid, IgA, amyloid, mixed cryogenivia type 2, non cryogenic vasculitis, polyarthrosis, focal segment testosterone. What is here CGN. your expected diagnosis, sir? The majority selected MBGN. What? No. Here, here, here. And H-I-G-A. The right, yes. Perfect, we've seen. Here, I-G-A, because MBGN, here you have the complement, is not at all consumed. And the main presentation here is hematuria, so that here the presentation is the common. Of course, everything is possible, as you know, Tama. Better than me, but we are, we are here making the change of logics. Here, the best diagnosis in this situation would be IgA nephropathy. This is the situation, of course. Yeah, uh, light microscopy have been Sorry. done and shows that yes. mild tubular injury and mesangial proliferation. And immunofluorescence show that, as we can see here, linear deposition of IgA. As we have mentioned previously, IgA, which is HCV, of course, may be association may be due to liver affection with IgA, maybe hepatitis C virus can induce IgA antibodies and can produce, of course, IgA nephropathy. And this is the part of the diagram that can occur. IgA hepatitis C virus can produce native kidneys, IgA nephropathy, transplant kidney, recurrent IgA or de novo IgA nephropathy. What are other risk factors in this situation? In IgA, obesity, hypertriglyceridemia, hyperuricemia, smoking, hypertension, all of the above, none of the above. What are the risk factors that you are searching if the situation is IgA? 
Here, mm -hmm. all of the above. These are the risk factors that you should be concerned in cases of IgA nephropathy. All of the above is here is the right answer. How you can treat this situation? This is my diagram, as we have mentioned. DAs, steroids, right. of course, still we are in the era of interferon. What is the absolute real risk score according to the real biopsy you have seen? Here is the, 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 the absolute here in this situation. I'm sorry, Malish. Here, the absolute real risk in this biopsy according to the biopsy. It is A, B, C, D, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. What's your opinion? In this situation, we have shown that we have mild tubular interstitial disease plus mesangial proliferation. So that here, the score is 1. 0 if you have only mesangial proliferative, 1 if you have mild tubular affection, 2 if you have moderate tubular affection, 3 if you have severe tubular affection. So that here, our score is 1. So that what is the incidence of the patient to, to, to reach de, uh, to, for death or dialysis at 10 year and 20 year score according to kidney condition in this situation? Answer A, B, C, or D. What's your opinion? In this situation, we have the scoring system for death and dialysis in case of IgA nephropathy. It is according to absolute rare risk factor. If it is zero, the risk after that is at 10 years and mortality 20 years is 4 percent b here is the appropriate answer because the score is one this is the right for uh, score one why if the score was was two c will be the right answer that means that that the risk at 10 years will be seven percent at 20 years will be 18 percent if we have score three the risk will be at 10 years 29 percent at uh, of course, 20 years, 64%. Here, our score was one, so that the right answer is B, which is the instance of mortality and deaths at 10 years will be 2%, and at 20 years, 9%. This lady, this lady should be treated for IgA nephropathy. Here, the answer, yes or no? That's right. Dr. Hussain. Dr. Hussain. Huh? Would, would you please stop here? This, this is the last question. Because, okay, this uh, will be the last question. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. This lady should be treated for IgA nephropathy, yes or no? What's your opinion? Here, the right answer is not to treat. Why not to treat? You not treat this lady because in this situation, you have hematuria only and you have normal kidney functions and you have subnephrotic range of pneumonia. In this situation, you're not giving this situation a neurosuppressive therapy. No treatment will change the outcome. No treatment yes, will change the right, outcome. Yes, this is right. But you give the situation only general measures. Uh, I'm sorry to say, you will not treat by immunosuppression, yes, but you are yes. by yes. this I will eat by yes, by herbs, by fish oil, and yes, but I agree. Immunosuppression. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I, I, I mean here immunosuppressive therapy. Yeah. The answer is no, we will not treat for this immunosuppressive therapy. Of course, we will not give here ribavirin. For that, and this is the answer. All of the following are suggested to be optimal therapy. Ace, satin, fish oil, all of the above, none of the above. What's your opinion? All of the above. Here, in this situation, except, I will give all that, except the statin. All the right. trick is except. I will give ACE, I will give fish oil, but because of the elevated liver enzymes, I will postpone here liver enzymes because I have about two to three folds elevation in my liver. Liver enzyme, so that I will give all the following, which is ACE or ARBS. Fish oil, but I will not give statin. Here, the right answer is B. Okay, Are Hussain. we justified to treat this Dr. lady Hussain. with steroids? Dr. Yes. Yes. Uh, excuse me. Um, uh, I think we should stop here. Dr. Amai. Okay. Dr. Amai, do you agree with me to stop? Uh, or to continue? Uh, very interesting case. Very interesting case. But yeah. yes, you can have a catadetamine directly acting antiviral era. Uh -huh. the, the, the case, we have three cases. No, no, no. The no, no. first part of that. And I'm in five parts. I'm in part D. If you pass to. 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 If you pass to.
وبارت لما العين بيعدي بتاعت فيروس وبارت لما معاه اتش اي بي ان شاء الله الحفيد الحفيد بتاعنا يا اخو <تصفيق> لا انا الصوب هنا بقى ما دام خمسه بارس يبقى بس الحلقه حلوه قوي حسين الحلقه حلوه حلوه يعني رائعه يعني فيها حاجات قويه رائعه بس في في وقت كده لابد ان انا يعني ان احنا نتوقف ليت مي تو ثانك اول سبيكرز بروفيسور ماي يعني كان عمل رائع جدا وتنظيم فوق الوصف بروفيسور جمال السعدي فيري انتريستنج اند فيري ديتيلد ادفايسز هاو تو ديل ويز هيباتيتس اند ترانسبلانتيشن دكتور حسين واز فيري ماجنيفيسنت اند اكسلنت ذا كيس واز فيري انتريستنج اند وي هوب تو كونتينيو ويز يو بروفيسور حسين نيكست برزنتيشنز ريلي ات واز فيري نايس نايت ويز قصر العيني ميديكال سكول وي ليرنت ا لوت فروم يور برزنتيشن And thank you all, uh, the uh, speakers and attendee, and all uh, who shared with us in the discussion, and hope uh, to uh, meet again and again. And يعني بتمنى لكم كلكم عيد سعيدة ورمضان كريم إن شاء الله. بكرة معنا مع الدكتور محسن القوسي يوم الأربعاء أز مع الدكتور القوسي في عرضه عن الدائرة أنتيفيرال دراجز بس مش أجنستي الهباتات سي أجنستي كوفيد 19. أشكركم وإلى اللقاء والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. شكرين. مع السلامة. مع السلامة. شكرا دكتور حسين، شكرا دكتور مي، شكرا دكتور جمال. شكرا دكتور آدم. مع السلامة. شكرا لكم جميعا. شكرا. مع السلامة.